Hello, this is Charlie again, and thank you for paying attention to some of these videos. Um, these are old presentations that we had, and we're just trying to do what we can to you know, help you get through the state test and learn what you can about our profession. So today is about roofing. Um, we do use some slides from Carson Dunlop, so you can purchase all those slides. Some of the pictures were drawn. Um, then obviously we've taken some photos as well. So first things first, we're going to start with the standards of practice. All right. Now, although the standards of practice are, exist for like Internachi and Ashi, uh, the ones we're basically going to be focused on is going to be the state of Illinois standards of practice. Um, so the most important thing is we have to describe the roofing material and then we have to report on how we inspected it. Okay. So it's not mandated that we have to walk on every roof or get real close to it. All we have to do is document how we did it. So it doesn't matter if you're doing it from the ground with binoculars, walking it, ladder at the eaves, drone, hot air balloon. It doesn't matter. Now, I think most of the people that do get up on roofs and do walk them and get closer to them and they're going to tell you the same thing that I will. Um, you're going to get a better view. There is no nothing else that's going to top it. Um, there's nothing else that's going to top it. No drone, no nothing else. I mean, there are alternatives with cameras on poles and drones, but nothing beats just being on there. But I get it. Sometimes you can't do it, so you're looking for other ways to get around and doing it. So again, we have to describe the roofing materials and we have to document what those roofing materials are. Okay. The first thing is I'm going to talk about the term slope and we're going to refer to these terms when we're talking about the different roofing materials. So there's three phrases I want you to be aware of and that's going to be the steep or conventional, low slopes, and flat roofs, all right? Basically, anything that is considered a, a steep or conventional is going to be over 4 and 12. And what that means is when we're talking about the horizontal run, whatever the measurement units we're talking about, let's say it's inches, so 12 inches in a horizontal run, that means we're going to go up four inches um, and that's going to determine what our slope is all right anything between 212 and 412 is going to be considered a low slope roof and anything 212 and under is going to be considered a flat roof flat roofs are never perfectly flat they do have to drain the water we don't want water sitting on there um, so we're going to have some sort of a slope that's going to direct the water to the drains, wherever they may be. Um, on the test, they are going to ask you for different types of shapes, I should say, of roofs that exist out there. Um, so we're just going to throw a few pictures up there and, and throw them out there. This is kind of an unusual one. I like to refer to it as an inverted gable but you're going to see them refer to it as a butterfly roof. So I do want you to know that term butterfly. And then if we're dealing with either a flat roof or a shed roof, all right? So a, a shed roof is what we're looking at in this picture. It's only going to have one slope on it, all right? If it's over 4 and 12, or I'm sorry, if it's over 2 and 12, so 312 or more, then it's going to be considered a shed roof. If it's 212 or less, then it's going to be considered a flat roof when it comes up there. So only one slope. We don't have the opposite slope, such as in a gable. This is also considered a shed roof. Actually, two different shed roofs that exist, all because the top of those shed roofs don't meet at the ridge board at the very top. So. This is what a lot of roofs that we see, it's called a gable. Probably going to be our most common one that we're going to run into. And again, just another view of the gable. Two slopes meeting with the ridge board at the top. Um, the garage is also a gable that comes in there. 
This one is known as a mansard, and we're only talking about the vertical portions, you know, that are going on an angle, not at the very top. Sometimes the top of the mansard could be a flat roof. Sometimes it's a hip. You know, they'll mix it up, you know, depending on what the architect calls for or what's going to be the the best install for whatever property you're looking at. But mansard is the part that kind of goes, it's part roof and part wall at the same time. Hip roof at the very top. Um, we're going to have four sides. They're all going to be sloped and come together. One of the drawbacks, and I guess one of the luxuries of the gable roof and one of the drawbacks of the hip roof, is we don't get to see the sides or the rake end of the gable. Seeing that rake end, it makes it real easy to determine how many layers of roofing material it is that's present. Um, but when we're dealing with hip roofs, because sometimes they're covered up, or more, all the time they're covered up, we don't always know if there's one layer or two layers or more. Kind of a aerial vision, same thing, another hip roof. So we basically have four slopes all coming together. Again, no rake end. We'll talk about the rake end a little bit. This is a combination of a hip roof on top and then a mansard roof on the, the wall sides. So let's focus in on one of the roofing materials. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is asphalt shingles. I'm going to sit tight here for a little bit and I'm going to ask that you do a little bit of writing. And the average lifespan of an asphalt shingles, usually we go with 15 to 20 years is what our company is going to say. Uh, but it's hard to tell, you know, the thicker that they make these shingles, excuse me, the thicker they make these shingles, the longer the lifespan that exists on them. Uh, Nachi actually sells these metal brackets that the shingle slides into and, and it goes on like a little bit of an angle. So the further in, the thinner it is. And that helps determine, and they got it written on there, what the lifespan of the shingles are. I play with that a few times. You know, I, can't verify how accurate it is because I've never bought different shingles to test with them. But I can assume that it's actually pretty accurate. So I pulled it out a couple times whenever my clients wanted to know a little more exact on what the lifespan is. All right. Um, so they do make them all the way up to 50 years for an asphalt shingle. So we really don't know what shingles going to be on there. So we use a, a very conservative number of 15 to 20 years. Now, what we try to do is, because our clients always want to know the lifespan of the roof. So what we try to do is figure out where it is by percentage of its lifespan. So is it brand new? Is it within the first 25% of its life, halfway through its life, three quarters of the way, you know, at the end or beyond the end? Uh, minimum slope on these roofs is going to be 212. When we install an asphalt shingle in 212, they're typically wider shingles too. We're only going to have one third of them exposed to the weather. Um, every single tab is supposed to be tarred down or glued down in place. Um, and then we still have the four nails. Now that's this low slope installation. Standard installation of shingles, we're just going to put four nails in there. Uh, typically, it's going to be one on each side and then one at the rain tabs that come in there. Now, when we deal with asphalt, some, you know, typically we're talking about uh, what do you call it? three tab shingles and not necessarily the dimensional shingles, but we're still going to do the install of the same. On standard installation, roughly 50% of the shingle is going to be exposed to the weather. And on low slope installations, which is really only 312, all right, low slope installation, it's going to be one third of the shingle is going to be exposed to the, to the over, I'm sorry, one third is going to be exposed to the weather. So as far as the overhang goes, and what we're talking about with the overhang is... See if I can grab a, a piece of paper here. So we're talking about the where the the roof 
ends up going over the eaves, all right? And and when it starts bending down, because these materials are are soft and flexible, we don't want them to overhang much more than an inch. What happens when it does that, it hangs over more than an inch, it ends up arching over, and we're going to talk about what the grain is doing in a little bit. But that separates the granules, exposes the asphalt to the UV rays, um, and actually causes it to fail. So I want you to remember one inch over the overhangs. Um, and really, that's more like three quarters. That one inch is a max. All right. Each shingle should be held with four roofing nails. We do have solid sheathing underneath it. So it does have to be smooth and straight. The weight is relatively light. So at 200 to 400 pounds per square, but realize every layer doubles that. So if I have two layers, now we're 400 to 800. And then if it's three layers, then we're going to be 600 to 1,200. You know, so it gets real heavy as we go through it. You're going to find a lot of communities in our area. We only allow two layers. After that, they want you to tear everything off. We used to be three. That was a long, long time ago. Um, the city of Chicago, they want you to actually get an engineer for the roof because of the weight. Anytime you put a second layer on, but it seems like people don't necessarily follow those rules. Um, when you start getting way south, and we're talking Florida, Louisiana, the southern coast, um, they only allow one layer. Now, there may be parts in southern Illinois that allow only one layer too. So you should be checking with your local um, building officials. And you can find a lot of that stuff. They, they keep all their codes and rules up on the website nowadays, which is fantastic, I have to say. But... You can go up there and search for those things without a problem. All right. So let's start building an asphalt shingle and see how these things are put together. You know, and when they're built in a factory, they're built in these, you know, just on a big, long assembly line. Typically, it's going to be in you know, around 12 or to 20 feet wide rolls. And they're going to start off with some sort of felt paper or base organic paper. All right. So when we deal with organic shingles, that paper is going to be an organic felt. When they're talking about fiberglass shingles, there's going to be fiberglass mixed in that paper. All right, That's the muscle of the shingle. That's the strength that kind of holds and keeps everything together. But it's not the waterproofing membrane. All right, In order to make a shingle waterproof, they're going to coat both the top and the bottom of that felt paper or that fiberglass mesh. They're gonna coat the top and the bottom of that with asphalt. That's gonna be our, our water repellent membrane, for lack of a better term. And depending on the thickness of that is also gonna determine the lifespan of these shingles. So the more asphalt that's put on there, the thicker it becomes, the longer these shingles are expected to last. Now asphalt does have one enemy. All right, it's the ultraviolet rays of the sun. And when the UV rays of the sun hit that asphalt, it causes it to dry out and shrink and crack and become brittle. And it could take one of those 20, 30, 50 year shingles and chew it up in a year or two. All right, so we need to protect those from any of the ultraviolet rays. And how we do that is by putting granules. Now the granules also give it color they also let it, um, well, mostly it's just color and protection from the UV rays is what it's going to do. But remember, when these things are built in a factory, they're built flat, all right? So we got to start thinking that when we start separating these things and bending these shingles, we're going we're gonna to take granules that were installed on a flat surface here, and then we're going to spread those out. When we spread it out, then we let those sun rays get in there. So keeping a, the shingles installed on a flat roof, I can't stress how important that is. Um, somewhere around the nailing holes, we're going to end up having a self-sealing strip. And that's designed so when they heat up and the sun hits it, it kind of locks them together and keeps everything from, going, from blowing apart or having the wind get up underneath these things and bend it back over. So typically, we're going to have four nails. Now, this is a typical three-tab shingle. It's brand new. Um, you know, I went to one of the Home Depots and grabbed a shingle, put it on the floor, and took a picture of it. 
So, but picture this whole thing being built straight up, uh, flat, on an assembly line. So, and then we smushed the asphalt, put the granules on top, you know, dropped in more asphalt across the the midline there so that the upper layer can go ahead and glue on it. And then we start cutting these things. Now, this is one of the weak areas of these shingles on the three tabs and even the, the dimensional ones as well. When we cut those slots in there, we don't have any granules on the sides. So as the sun hits the granules coming in on an angle, it causes that area to dry up and shrink. And you're going to see on the three tabs that that's going to open up the older it gets. So typically they start off at about an eighth of an inch and then they double as they go through each of their 25 percentile. Now I got nothing in writing that says that, that's just from our experience. So when we see something that's roughly a quarter inch, we're going to say 25 percent. Um, half inch, we're going to say halfway through its life. One inch, we're going to say three quarters. And of course, you know, anything bigger than that, we're going to start curling, cupping. We're going to be doing a whole bunch of changes in that. So a few rules how we put these things together. Uh, let's start with the, at the very bottom with the eave. There's uh, three different processes. You know, there's the good, the better, and, um, and the best. And most of the time we just do the good, all right? So they'll take that first row right above the arrow that says eave end up on the drawing. And they'll take that first row and they'll flip it upside down. When that's flipped upside down, then, then that's solid. We don't have the three spaces in between there. And they're going to put one row there. And then they're going to go ahead and start our first initial row right above that. So the very beginning, we're going to end up having two rows that started in there. So that's what's normal. That's pretty much just what everybody does. They might even get cheaper shingles to put in there just to save a few bucks um, when it comes with it. And especially when they're dealing with the architectural shingles or the dimensional shingles. You know, they want to keep it smoother and flatter, so you're better off going with the three tabs. What's a better option than this is when we go ahead and cut those tabs off and we just put the top half, including the self-sealant strip, at the very bottom. Now, when we do that, then we're going to take that self-sealant strip and it's going to glue straight on with the first row. So that's going to keep that tip nice and tight. If I just spin it upside down, I don't have that sealant all the way at the bottom. I have it up in the middle where the nails are going to go. And it doesn't keep the bottom two layers together. Now, truthfully, we don't get too many problems with that. So otherwise, they would, they being code officials and insurance agencies and such, they would be pushing harder not to do the flip over of the first way. The best way to do it is they have something called a starter roll that exists out there. That comes in big, long rolls, and basically it's all one continuous piece, and there's no splits. When we cut the shingles or we flip the shingles, those are going to be three feet long, and then every three feet we're still going to have a, a space in between the two shingles that we want to be aware of. So we double up the first row, and then we build off from there. In our area up here in Chicago, it's very common that we do a 50% um, fifty percent step off when it comes to it. And in doing that, in doing the 50% step off, then when we look up these shingles, it's going to be basically looking like straight as an arrow. All right, there's an alignment slot that's up there as well. And um, that alignment slot is what keeps those things perfectly straight. Now, that's at the top of the shingle, and you just flip it, and then you slide the next one right next to it, and it keeps it either 33% step off or a 50% step off. Um, I've seen it in... Where was I? I think it was like Kansas City area. It's very common that they do a 33% step off on their shingles. So when you're looking at it, 
kind of how this drawing looks like. It goes up on an angle when it comes to it. But um, yeah, mostly what I'm talking about is this area like right here. And then as we go straight up, that's going to be straight as an arrow. Or if I start here, every other one's going to go straight as an arrow when it comes up there. All right. These are dimensional shingles that we're seeing installed. And you can see they're stepping off every six inches, roughly. And that's going to be where that alignment tab is going to be at the very top. And again, that's going to be like right in this area. Right up in there. If at that one, right above that red dot, you can actually see where it looks like it's lifted up a little bit. And that happens. Another view. And then over here, we can see the lighter gray stuff here. That's going to be our south ceiling strip coming in there. You can see our nails. Four to each one. Now, what's nice about this is it's gonna, it's, it's gonna go through not only the top shingle here, but you can see where the bottom one is sticking out as well, and it's gonna go through that, so it holds them both down nice and tight. This is our first row down here, and they ended up flipping those shingles upside down, and then you could also see the self sealing strip in there. Common things that happen with the shingles, um, one is hail damage. All right. And it's a big insurance claim when it comes to it. I'm going to put down one of our roofing companies that we work with here. I know some people have kind of bad feelings toward them. They think that they're kind of like storm chasers or ambulance chasers. and But you know what? The bottom line is the hail does damage the roof. And it may not happen right away. Um, it might take two to three years before it happens. But a lot of people don't realize that when the hailstorm happens, you have only one year to file a claim, even though the damage might not occur until two to three years from now. And if you don't file that claim within that year, then it's going to be you holding the bag. And if you did get hit with enough of them and you got to replace enough shingles, it's sometimes better off replacing the entire roof. And roofs nowadays, they're just not cheap. So they cost money. And this one here, though, I'm not too sure if that's a hail pack or if that was a nail that wasn't pushed in all the way. And that caused the shingle to arch and then the sun hit it and it, and it uh, popped off. But usually when you see the circles as we're showing at the top there, that's typically going to end up being hail damage. So again, I want to refer to sunlight. That's going to be our biggest enemy because most of the sun is going to come from the south side of the roofs and the west side of the roof. Those are, that's where it's going to be the strongest. Those are going to be the areas that end up, um, they're going to be the areas that end up wearing out faster, all right, as opposed to the north and the east. Steeper slo slopes do last longer. I think a lot of that has to do with water as well. The water gets off the roof much quicker, um, but it's still the sunlight is going to be the thing that we watch for. When we do lose our granular coverings, and remember the granular coverings is what protects the asphalt, then what happens to the asphalt is dries up, and when it dries up, it begins to crack, um, buckling, it, it turns under, and then curling, it turns up. Right. Foot traffic, tree branches, downspouts, um, lots of discharge or water flowing in a certain area. These are all things that are going to wash away granules. And when we wash away the granules, we expose the roofing materials to the UV rays of the sun. And that's really what shortens the lifespan of the roofs. All right. Some common defects that we run into when it deals with asphalt shingles. Um, and actually, this one's a fiberglass shingle. If you look up here just sort of right at that, dot, you can see those little white lines in there. You know, that's the fiberglass mesh that's installed on these things. Um, sometimes there's going to be water that gets trapped in between the layers. And when that happens and it turns to steam, then that causes the granules to pop off. 
Now this roof may never leak, but that area that we're looking at right there that's black, that may uh, that may be deteriorated. Once the sun starts getting to it, it's only going to be a couple years or so. This picture, you can see how, what I was talking about with the three tabs, how they start opening up as time goes by. And you get that, I don't know, more of an upside down V shape where it comes with it. That's all telling me that we're at the end of our lifespan right now. You can see we're also clawing. So when the shingles claw, they turn under each other. When they cup, they start coming up. I'm sorry, when they curl, they go straight up. And then when they cup, the corners end up going up. So right now we're at the clawing stage. But this roofing that we're looking at here, this is pretty far gone and pretty far past its expected lifespan. Right. This photo was taken on a FHA certification. And that's another thing to add in there. Once you get your license for a home inspection, you are going to be eligible to do FHA certifications. One of them is going to be for the roof. All right. So an appraiser went to this property. Um, they saw the roof from the ground. They said it didn't look right. And they wanted to get a roofing certification. Uh, roofing certifications can be done by licensed roofers or licensed home inspectors. All right. So what happened was they, the first time I went there, they put the new asphalt roof on, roof on, but they didn't have anything to cut them with or didn't realize that you had to cut them. So they took the rake in and they rotated their shingles and they went straight up and down the rake. And there was no way that was going to end up keeping water out. So I told them that this has to be, the, each one of these rows needed to be extended over and then you cut it at the end. And their, their solution was to lift up the shingles and slide more shingles underneath it and let that run wild on there. Um, because of which we get more than half that shingle exposed to the weather and it just... It wasn't the right way to do it. Um, but looking at it with the number of layers that was on it, I'm like, yeah, it's will probably last three years or more. And the buyer was happy with it. They were satisfied to do it. So I signed off on the paperwork. It might be not be done to standards, but that's not really what the certification is asking for. All you're doing is certifying, and the banks are a little bit different. Some want a two-year certification some want a three-year certification so they're not asking you to guarantee anything but they are asking you to certify that your opinion is truthful and in this case i think my opinion is brand new shingles even installed like this was going to last at least three years so i signed the paperwork for them um, here we have a little bit of scorching that's coming up. Typically when the attics get really hot and we get a lot of heat that comes out of the mushroom vents, uh, that's the black staining that you see there. So it's just a good indicator. Now with extra heat in the attic, that causes the asphalt of the shingles to heat up as well. And when they're hot, then the granulars, the granules don't want to stick to it all that well. So sometimes they'll end up falling off. And once that gets exposed, then we start losing the lifespan of the of the shingles. And then also too, if you can, I think this one shows it well. So you can see how it starts getting it wider and then it was kind of narrowed up there at the top. You know, so this is about halfway through its lifespan, you know. And then sometimes we just run into stuff and you have to start asking yourself, you know, what were you thinking? And it just doesn't make sense. Um, but some of the points I said earlier is why I put these slides up here, just so we can show what happens when you violate these rules. So number one, we talked about the asphalt shingles and the one inch overhang. Now this shingle slid down. It was way up underneath there. You could see where the asphalt strip right here, the dotted black lines, 
that's supposed to be directly underneath this area up here, all right? So obviously that shingle slid down. But when it came up over the gutter, you can actually see how it bent and it became flexible. This is going to be our weakened area right in here. All right. And then they must have had some problems with the valley in there because it looks like that extra piece was added on later. But um, I don't know. I'm not too confident that that'll do well. Patching is another you know, clue that something's not working right, basically. And I don't know. I get to be a little bit of a smart ass, I guess. You know, and I try to tell people that human beings don't go up on a roof and put tar up on the roof for decoration. You know, they do it because they're chasing water. All right. So anytime we see this or even around the plumbing stack over here, anytime we see any any sort of patching, we document it, we call it out. If it's exposed to the UV rays, it's the same thing as if the granules weren't there for the shingles. You're only going to get about a year or two, and then it's going to dry out. So our clients have an option. They can either negotiate or pay to have this valley done properly so it doesn't have to be maintained. Same thing with that plumbing stack off to the left. Or they can go up there every year and check it. And once it begins to show signs of cracking, and it will, you know, the most they'll get is two years. Um, then they go up there, shmooey, more tar up on there. I mean, I don't like that solution, but it's not my house. And I'm just going to give people options. And whatever they choose to do, it's going to be what they choose to do. Obviously, if you ignore it, then water is going to be entering your building. So another valley patched up. Um, it's kind of a low slope for those shingles as well. You know, and when that's the, the case, each one of those is supposed to be glued in shape. But yeah, you know, when you, you know, when you start getting, well, we'll talk about the valley flashings in a little bit. That upper roof there should have been on top of the lower roof. And it kind of looks like the lower roof was put on top of the upper roof on this one. So the faster water, the water that moves the quickest or the most amount of water, those shingles go on top, all right? So the steeper the roof, the bigger the roof goes up on top. Um, that way it's not going to be forced to roll underneath there. But I bet you this one here, the, the water was running underneath the shingles when it was raining hard. Um, so they're trying to stop that, and that's why they put the asphalt up there. Uh, plumbing stack boots, uh, B-vent boots, all the flashing. Uh, typically, in the absolute proper way, is half the shingles are supposed to be on top of the boot and half the shingles are supposed to be underneath. Now, just because somebody does something incorrectly doesn't mean it's going to leak. So what I'm saying is like this shingle, this row right in here, is supposed to be on top of this boot up on here. Same thing on the other side. You could even make an argument for this row here. And I've seen them where they come all the way down to the one almost to the very end. And I'm okay with that too. You know, The whole idea is to figure out how we're going to be shedding water and to prevent anything from going up. But if all I have is just this little inch or two right up here, I think I'm being kind of risky. And the more nails and holes that I put in the exposed part and not covered up, the more chances that I'm going to have to bring water coming in here. All right. So one of the things that we push when we're doing our roofing inspections is not to give anybody false hope. You know, we always want to give the worst case possibility and then hope for the best. All right. Now, depending on the age of everything else, we're going to give all considerations their due justice. But in this situation with the amount of holes coming in there, I'm going to tell them it's a poor job. And that way, if it does leak in the future, they're not going to be pointing the finger at me. So Here, you know, they had the starter course damage. There's supposed to be two layers underneath there. You'll see this done with the animals. You'll see it done just from wear and tear as it comes to it. But once it starts leaking into the overhang, then we're going to start getting damages done. We need to keep this area watertight. All right. 
This one's kind of a no-brainer. We can see our shingles are old. They've been lifted up. Somebody went there and put a bunch of nails in, holding everything down. Um, you know, it kind of makes our job a little bit easier because it's it's kind of obvious this thing's at the end of its lifespan. It's It has leaked in the past. When we go inside, we're going to look for signs of those leaks. Whether or not it's still leaking really doesn't matter because I lost so much of the granules. We got so many areas that are just so worn out. A replacement is going to be expected or should be done, you know, sooner than later. You know, your options are simple. You can ignore it and wait for the roof to leak, fix the leak, and then fix the damage that it caused. Or you can replace the whole roof and be comfortable for 15, 20 years or more. This one is, they didn't put a, they didn't put enough nails in there. And this was given to us from another home inspector. And when he was walking up there, the shingles let loose and they slid down. And when that happened, you know, he went back and he looked at it. He's like, oh my God, there was only one nail that was really holding all these shingles up there. And they just twisted on them and they haven't sealed all together yet. Um, rare that stuff like that happens, but it does happen. All right. More wind damage. These shingles are actually pretty new. Um, this is the hip flashing that comes up there. And you can see how the wind just got underneath there and pulled big chunks of these things off. The field looks pretty decent. Um, and for me, I don't know, I would actually kind of wrap over the ends. And then the other thing too, there's no felt paper in here. There's no, and the felt paper is kind of a lubricant. Um, because everything expands and contracts at different rates, the wood and the asphalt I'm talking about. So we want to let those things move. Um, I'm a big fan of putting ice and water shield at the eaves, in the valleys, around all the flashings. Um, that self-adhering, self-sealing membrane is pretty powerful stuff. So I would like to see that there too. Now we'll never know if it's missing. You know, the only way to tell that something's not there is they actually start removing shingles. Now, this is, again, wind damage. This wasn't us removing any of the shingles, so don't let me mislead anyone in any which way on that. So now we're going to get off of asphalt shingles, and we're going to start talking about wood shakes and wood shingles. Um, even though we're going to treat them as the same thing, I do want you to know the difference between the two. But before we do that, let's take a few notes and write a few things down. So typical lifespans of shakes and shingles are 30 to 40 years. Um, on this slide, we're saying 15 to 20. My apologies, I didn't upgrade this one. Minimum slope is 4 and 12. Uh, typically, one-third of the shake, <clears throat> one-third of the shake is going to be exposed to the weather. We want to hold each one. Of, and when I say shake, I mean shingle as well. And we want to... Install each one of these shakes with at least two nails. Old school shakes, they were installed on skip sheathing, um, which was nice because that skip sheathing allowed these shakes to dry out much quicker. What shortens their lifespan is when they stay wet or they hold water longer. And when I put them on a flat roof with either interlayment or underlayment, um, we're holding a lot of water in there. But when we put them on a skip sheathing, the air flowing uh, underneath and above them gets them to dry out. These roofs have been known when they have the skip sheathing and they're open to last over 100 years. I mean, it, especially with the good thick shake that's on there. Um, but we just don't do that anymore. So we nowadays we like to put in there solid plywood roof decking. And then we'll either put interlayment or underlayment. I'll talk about the difference in a little bit. Um, either way. Sh uh, shingles, however, they can only be installed with full underlayment where shakes can go either way. Light weight for these roofs. Cedar is not a heavy wood. However, because it holds water, um, they usually build these things to be about 1,000 pounds per square. We can't put a second layer on these. So once they're done, they're done. We tear them off. Um, the biggest problem I see people with wood roofs is they don't maintain them. And you do need to bring somebody out there annually. They do need to be treated. Um, 
you know, I've, I've seen these roofs fail in 15, 20 years, um, and they should get twice that, all right? They shouldn't be going that quick, so, and no more than one layer. So I do want you to know the difference between a, a shake and a shingle, all right? On the left-hand side is a shingle. On the right-hand side is a shake. Uh, shakes, they're split. All right? So they're done with chunks and they're, they're not cut. They're not sawed. They're just split when they make it. They're usually going to end up being thicker where shingles are going to be machine cut. So they're going to be smoother, straighter, thinner. Um, they're typically going to be even widths where the shakes are going to be different widths You know, when it comes to it. So if it looks neat, even pattern, that's going to be a shingle. Those do, those are thinner. They are not going to have such a long lifespan. Very rarely are you going to see those installed on a roof. More common, they might be used as wall cladding, um, which when it's straight up and down like that, that does extend the lifespan. Plus, they're going to seal it and paint it much better too. So rough surface, different widths, and they're thicker. Those are going to be wood shake roofs. Uh, smooth finish, even widths, thinner, usually about maybe a half of an inch at its thick point going up down to zero. Those are going to end up being shingles, wood shingles. So we're going to, the shingle and shakes are, you know, kind of the same when it comes to it. They come in different lengths. And you know, they come in different lengths. And we mentioned earlier that typically one third of that shake is exposed to the weather. So I'm trying to keep the math um, a little bit simpler here, I guess. So if the, if the shingle length is 16 inches, and that's why they're saying five inches is exposed to the weather. So five times three is 15, one inch off gives us the uh, 16 inches. So 18 inches, one third of that is six. So we're showing five and a half. 24, one third of that is eight. So they're showing seven and a half. It's not like we've put tape measures on this stuff anyway. So we want to be in that ballpark. Now the drawing that they have up here, we're showing full underlayment. And I do want to talk about that um, eave protection. Now, when we're dealing with eave protection, where, let's see if I, well, I know what I need to do. There we go. And I'm going to zoom in. There we go. Now, when we're dealing with e-protection, they want you to be aware of when and where the e-protection is supposed to be. So, if I have here my wall, and then I build my rafter coming up here, we're going to take the outside of this wall, and we're going to make an imaginary imaginary line going up, all right? And then from here, we're going to want to be at least two feet from that wall where it comes up on there. The reasoning is if I do hit any sort of ice damming, so I'm going to have heat loss up in this area here, that's going to melt snow. This is all for ice damming. Once that snow melts, it's going to turn to liquid. Liquid is going to come to the overhang, and then it's going to start to freeze again. All right. And it's going to turn to ice. And then more water is going to come by, and that dam is going to get higher and higher. And that's usually when we end up seeing those icicles that form. But the real problem is going to be the water that's going to be pooling behind there. And as that water pools behind there, it, um, cause shakes and shingles, they're not watertight membranes. So that water is going to work its way up underneath the shingles and shakes, and then it's going to start coming to the inside of the house. So what we need to know is
three feet from the overhang or two feet on a horizontal run to here. Now they have ice and water shield. That only comes in three foot rolls, all right? So putting this original three foot roll, it's going to be done automatically. The problem comes in is if I have a huge overhang here, then that three feet going up might not get me to two feet inside. So then I'm going to put another roll on top of that. I hope that makes sense. All right. There we go. I was having trouble getting back to the slides. Alrighty. First course is doubled at the very bottom. And remember on the asphalt shingles, we said we only want to be uh, three quarters of an inch of the overhang. In this section, we want to be no less than an inch and a half on the overhang. And the purpose of that is something called a capillary effect. So as water starts coming down the shingles here, let's see if I can, here we go. What we don't want it to do is go up underneath there, stick to the wood shingles and start working its way back up. You know, so coming down here and then working its way back up underneath it and damaging our structure in that way. All right, so we want to have at least an inch and a half overhang. Three quarters of an inch for something that's flexible, an inch and a half for something that's not flexible. So when we're dealing with wood, slate, concrete, um, clay tile, you know, even with metal roofs, we want to have a good inch and a half overhang. Couple different rules. You don't have to necessarily memorize each and every one of these things. Um, there's going to be a couple. This first one is going to be one of them that I'm going to want you to remember. And um, it gets tedious when we do wood shakes and wood shingles. Um, I'm not, I don't know any home inspector that actually walks on these roofs. So I would encourage you not to. I know I won't. I'm just not that familiar with them. And if there's any algae, they get slippery. Why take a chance? And 412 is pretty steep for a wood roof and you don't want to damage it either. So we do them from the ground. And basically when we go across and looking at everything, we're going to look at each one of these tabs. And then we're going to go up one row, then up two rows. Um, and make sure that they don't align with each other. All right. Because one third is exposed to the weather, that means I'm going to have three layers of shakes or three layers of shingles but these first ones as we're looking at it the two arrows they're pretty much on top of each other right so i know that right here i got a gap just because that's the way the install is i know that this one here i got a gap again just because of the way the install is now if this middle one because that's the only one now keeping the water from getting through if that middle one tends to split right there, well then guess what? I'm through all the way now. And that's gonna end up letting water come in. <coughs> so we don't want these things lining up within three rows, just in case we lose the one or the one cracks, then water's gonna end up coming through. All right, inch and a half offset between the knots and the gaps above. That, again, I don't care that you know. A quarter inch to three eighths. This one I do want you to know. So those gaps in there, this is when it's dry. Um, these shakes and shingles are supposed to have a, a decent sized gap in between them. Sometimes if you're on split sheathing and you're in the attic looking out on these things, you'll see daylight. All right, it's not uncommon. 
uh, that you'll end up seeing that from the inside. But we do want to have these gaps in here. Now, when they get wet, the wood swells up. And when it swells up, that kind of closes a lot of those gaps up in there. But what we don't want to have them is butted up right next to each other. Because then when they try to swell up, we're going to be pushing them up. And then they're going to be getting those ends lifted up. And that's actually going to damage and crack the shingles. So we need to give them room to expand and contract as they get wet and dry. Two fasteners per shingle, three quarter to one inch from the end. There's no way that we're going to be able to tell that. Uh, inch and a half to two inches above the next course. You're not going to really be able to tell that either. Um, inch and a half offset between the courses. Okay. And no more than eight inches wide. You know, even if it is, I don't even know what we would be able to tell somebody, you know, take out that shake and put smaller ones in there. I don't think it's going to happen. So for me, when they're dry, I want to see a gap in between there. And then I want to make sure that they don't line up. Now, again, if we find one shake or one shingle that lines up, call it out. Let them know maybe. But, you know, it's not until we get to that 10, 20 percent mark that we need to really start making somebody aware of it when it comes on there. Um, the biggest thing is we don't want to have a roof leak and then a roofing contractor comes out because, well, this was installed wrong. And then they come back and say, well, I hired a home inspector. Why didn't you tell me? And that's how everything ends up being a problem that we end up purchasing and we don't want to purchase. All right. So this drawing, I kind of like it. The bottom half shows solid sheathing where the upper half shows skipped uh, sheathing. Typically, skipped sheathing is going to be on a 50% deal, so half of it's going to be open, and then a board, another half gap, and another board. Again, first course is doubled. E-protection we talked about, 36 inches minimum, and it has to go two feet to the interior. All right. Again, one-third of the shake is exposed to the weather. Um, not too much more to see here. We're still showing full underlayment on that drawing. All right. Now this drawing here, they're showing the difference between underlayment and interlayment. So the ice and water shield is, is underlayment at this point of time. And then in between each course or each row of the shakes or the shingles, they're going to put felt paper. And that felt paper is known as interlayment in this situation. This is probably the best way to do it. Any water that does get through, the felt paper is going to kind of keep it and shedding it on top as it works its way up on there. But I do want you to know the difference between underlayment, which is underneath everything, or interlayment, which goes in between the layers up there. All right. Slate roofs are going to be our next roofs. Um, High-end homes. And I don't know. I think they're just beautiful, plain and simple. Uh, they do come in different lifespans. It's, you're going to find that the darker the slate, the shorter the lifespan. When you get these colorful ones that we're showing up on here, these are you know, like the 200-year markers that comes in there. All right. So typical lifespan is going to be 75 to 200 years. We're not going to know that. Minimum slope is going to be 6 and 12. Any roofing material that has this kind of weight to it, so you're going to see the same thing for the clay and the concrete and, you know, what else is there to slates on this one here. They're all going to be 6 and 12. We don't want to be any flatter than that. Too much weight for the wood that's supporting it up there. Um, it, it depends on the style of the slate. All right. Typically with the flat pieces, as we're showing here, we're going to get about 50% of the slates that are going to be exposed to the weather. But you will see them where there's going to be like 80 to 90 percent that's going to be exposed to the weather. So this isn't, you know, a, a dead set science. Different materials, different shapes, they're going to be installed in different ways. Uh, two galvanized nails, and I do want you to remember this, you know, two galvanized nails right here. And, and think about this. If I got a slate, a, you know, a piece of stone, that's going to last 200 years. Do I really think that a, you know, two galvanized nails is going to last 200 years as well? And I, and I hope you don't because it won't. All right. Um, when they're out there exposed to the weather, the humidity, the moisture, everything else, they will get eaten away. 
they do rust, even if they're galvanized, they do fail. And then what, and this is common when we're dealing with slate roofs, and we're gonna talk about slate hooks in a little bit, but when those nails rust out, you're gonna see that they, they end up basically sliding down off the roof, all right, just because of their weight when it comes to it. Um, they are heavy, again, no more than one layer that gets installed. And they should have solid sheathing and full underlayment underneath these things. All right. Uh, term rock ribbon. All right. These are the darker, shorter life black slates that come in here. And more or less, I want you to know the term. I don't know if you'd actually be recognizing it. And we're not going to really be calling it out anyway until it becomes a problem. And they start becoming damaged. All right. But what it is is basically when the stone gets pushed together, when it gets cut, you know, it was different layers that ended up getting squished together to form that stone. And when we slice them to make the slates, these are, even though they're sealed tight to a point, but because they're not all one piece, they're two different layers, water gets in between the layers. And when water gets in between the layers and it freezes, it expands, because slates are weak in tension, they're, they're going to want to break and they're going to want to release and let go. When that happens, then obviously they could cause a leak and they're going to need to be replaced. One of the things with slate roofs, and I always recommend that these things get, again, maintained and inspected once a year by a company that's familiar dealing with the slates. Um, most of the roofing companies are not going to recommend that you fix a slate just because it's cracked or damaged. They are actually going to wait and see that water's coming in. I know it sounds crazy, but the problem with it is you end up, it's expensive. You end up breaking more slates, repairing the one broken slate, and as long as it's doing what it's supposed to do and keep the water out, then they tend to ignore it, plain and simple. But I do want you to know what a ribbon slate is, and you see it with the different lines. On this drawing down here, they're talking about this shade pattern right in here. All right. and of course, it's been there for a while. Nothing's ever happened to it. I honestly don't even know if I would put it in the report. Um, I don't know. I, I guess it would depend on how many areas and how much of it it was on there, whether or not I would bring it to the attention of my client. But typically the the line that you would see in there that's supposed to be faced out so water can't get into it. So let's chat a little bit about repairs. You can see in the first picture, we got a broken, a broken slate. What happens when they do the repairs, they're gonna chisel or chip it out and remove that entire slate. If they're lucky and it was just the nails that were rust it out and the whole thing slipped through, that just makes the life a lot easier. Then they're going to put a slate hook in. They're going to screw it in or nail it in right in between the two slates that are below it. They're going to get that hook or that, that bottom of that slate hook and they're going to line it up with the bottom. Then they're going to schmooey some tar on it on the slate. They're going to slide it up in there and basically glue it in place and let that slate hook um, hold it and keep it from sliding down. So when we look at these, and this is normal, all right, this is something that's to be expected when you're dealing with slate roofs. And we need to make sure that our clients expect this because it is going to happen and we want to prepare that it's going to happen so that they're not angry at us when it does happen. Um, we're looking for these slate hooks from the bottom. Sometimes there'll be a, a wide flat piece. Sometimes it'll just look like a coat hanger and sticking down there and holding these things up into place. But if you look carefully enough, depending on the age of the roof, usually once we get to 50 years plus, you're going to end up seeing a few of them. All right. um, they do make a new EPDM or plastic roof that looks like slate. And you just can't tell unless you get up there. Now, this is bendable and flexible. In fact, what's weird about this is you actually have to, you're supposed to bend the fake slate, you know, for lack of a better term. You're supposed to bend it before you install it so that when you install it, it's going to be arched 
and then it's got two spots where the holes go through and then that pushes it flat and kind of holds it flat when it comes in there. Um, I know there's a, a big area up in Glenview called the Glen and just about it, well, every commercial building is done with this stuff and a lot of the residentials are as well. And again, same thing, just another view. And yeah, looking at it from here, I would guess that it's slate, you know. And again, the only way to tell is to get up close. Again, just another view. This is all plastic or all EPDM that comes in there. All right, clay, concrete, fiber, cement. We're going to treat them all as the same, you know, as far as this next section goes and what we look for it. Um, when you're dealing with concrete, if you get your, get your ladder up there and put your hand on it, it's going to be rough and you're going to feel the aggregate that's in there. Um, typically, it'll be the almost the same as a sidewalk, old school sidewalk that comes up there. When we're dealing with clay, um, the clays are going to be smooth when you to the touch. That'll be pretty much the only difference. Uh, fiber cements, we really don't see too much of those anymore, um, but it's going to be a mixture between, um, I don't know what kind of fibers they actually put in there, but um, yeah, it's kind of the, I think it's more of just a, a different type of aggregate that they mix into it. And it's a smoother, but it's like in between the concrete and the clay tile itself. So typical lifespans, 40 plus years, minimum slope, same as a slate, six to 12. Um, roughly 80% of the shingle or the clay tile is exposed to the weather. Uh, but again, it depends on the pattern. Sometimes it's 90, sometimes it's actually down to 50%. Each of the, each of the tiles should be in place with two galvanized nails. And again, that would be a common thing that would fail on these. Um, tiles should be installed in solid sheeting, full underlayment. They are heavy, 1,000 pounds per square. And again, no more than one layer would get installed up there. I'm going to zip through these three, and then I'm going to come back to this slide. All right. So there's basically three different types of installs that we're going to run into. Uh, the first one is mission style. That's what's shown up in here. And then you're going to see the one piece or the S tiles and then the interlocking clay tiles. We'll come back to those in a bit. All right. In the mission styles, I do want you to be able to identify the different pieces or what they're called. They're basically the same. It all depends if they're installed cup up or cup down. Cup up is called a pan. Cup down is called a cover. Um, there's different ways that they're going to that they're going to go ahead and support the covers. You know, the most common is actually going to be with wood bat strips, like we're showing in this diagram. But I know I'm going to show some other ways in a little bit. Sometimes you'll see them mortared in place. Sometimes you'll see them with hooks that are tied in there. So there's a mixture. Out of this diagram, I want you to get the pan and the cover. Those are the two main things that I want to push in there. Um, S tiles are kind of like interlocking. They're the first step that comes to it. Um, and this is probably the most common one that we're going to see, at least up in, in the north suburbs where I live. Um, that's, you know, here in Naperville. Uh, those are in, yeah, part of the lake, part of um, yeah, Lakeview and Lincoln Park and Saugenash. They have a lot of clay tiles in those neighborhoods as well. Uh, but most of us are going to run into the asphalt tiles. But the ones that we do run into are going to be either older homes that will have the pan and the covers or anything newer is going to have the S tile here. Um, we do run into interlocking clays and these you can see we're almost 90% exposed to the weather. Um, so again, it's just how they're designed and how they're installed where we come to it. So I talked about securing the pans and the covers. Um, the first picture we showed in the beginning had the wood bat strip straight up and down. Uh, these drawings are shown where they run a wire tie through it and hold everything from sliding down. 
Uh, mortars used with slate hooks on there. All these are exceptional options, or not exceptional, but they're acceptable options. Um, and which one you're going to run into, I cannot say. Right. Naming strips, horizontal battens. Uh, the battens are going to be for the interlocking tiles. You're not going to see battens installed for pans, covers, or S tiles coming in there. All right. Another term I want you to be aware of is called um, eave closure. And what we want to do is prevent animals from getting up in there. But we also want to let moisture that might be get that might get trapped in there. We might want to let that, well, we definitely want to let that out. So these are going to either be sealed up with small holes in there to let it go, or they're going to be foam pieces that get put in there, or sometimes a mesh that gets put in there as well. And that way it's allowed to breathe, but it keeps the animals and birds from climbing up in there. All right. Concrete tiles, again, we're going to treat them as the same. They come in many different patterns, whether it's the S style, the curve, flat interlocking, or just straight up flat. All right. So here's a typical interlocking clay tile. Uh, one area I want to draw your attention to is over here on the rake. And that's called a weather block when we're dealing here. So that's designed to keep water from blowing in from the sides and getting up underneath the tiles themselves. All right. And all in all, this one, you know, doesn't look bad at all. I mean, it's got a few little cracks here, you know, some smaller cracks here, but all in all, it looks pretty decent. All right. And we zoom in on it and get a little closer. And again, I don't see too many issues that are going on here at all. Same roof. This is in the valley. Um, we're going to talk about flashings in a little bit. But there is one rule that I want to bring to your attention. The flashing materials that we use have to last as long or longer than the roofing material itself. All right. So in this situation, because these clay tiles are going to last 40 to 60 years, we can't put roll roofing in a valley flashing on these. It has to be some sort of metal. Typically, it's going to end up being copper, something that will last a long time. Asbestos or fiber cement or asbestos cement. Um, I'd like you to, you know, either save this picture up here, do a little screenshot or whatever. Um, but just get a rough idea of what it looks like. Now, when you tap on these, they're going to be very tinny if you get your ladder up and get close to it. Uh, even the mastic on some of the other stuff had asphalt in it as well. Um, asbestos is a big deal. A lot of people get nervous with that stuff. All these commercials you see for the mesothelioma stuff um, is, legit, is legitimate and then it becomes litigious. So I kind of bring it up to their attention, and if they want to have it tested, there are laboratories that do this sort of testing. Um, if I find a loose piece that's sitting on the ground, I could put it in a baggie and, and send it off to them, and we do charge uh, to do that sort of testing on there. Um, but that's really the only way you're going to be able to tell is if it is to send it to a lab, all right? We can make an assumption, and... You know, I'm always fine with assumptions, just as long as you tell your client this is nothing more. And the only way to verify for sure is that we send it to a lab. All right. Another fiber cement or shingles, when you get those big rectangulars or big diamond shaped ones, these are going to be on houses that are built around 1900s. All right. And I'm talking about 1900 hundreds, not 1999. So, they're going to be over a hundred years old. Uh, we really don't make these shingles anymore. So they're going to be difficult to come by in case they need to be repaired. All right. The next roof we'll talk about are metal roofs. Um, I actually put a metal roof at my house once we did the remodel and truthfully, I love it, you know, and I get it. They are a little bit noisier and you do hear the rain when it rains. Um, but we have enough insulation up in the rafters. You know, we made our attic part of the conditioned space. It does away with the sound. And even if you do have it on the ceiling in there, that's again, is going to eliminate a lot of the sound. What's nice about them is they're lightweight. 
they got long lifespans on them. Um, if they get dented, it really doesn't harm anything from the hail. And they, they usually interlock and hold each other pretty tight together. So it's rarely have I seen these things get damaged where they get blown off. Um, even I remember watching the when Hurricane Katrina came through and the news was showing so much of the damage back then of all the roofs. And you see the asphalt shingles and those are just stripped clean of the wood. And yet you see metal roofs on the houses right next door to them. And they look as good as the day that they were installed. All right. And like no damage has ever even heard to them. So I'm, I was impressed when I saw that on the news. And um, so that's one of the reasons why we chose what we chose. So there is no minimum slope. Uh, they can weld these things. They can make them watertight membranes. And they can put them on pretty much a flat roof. Um, each exposure is different from the manufacturer. They make metal roofs that look like standing seams. They make them where they look like asphalt shingles. They make them look like wood. Uh, sometimes you can't get up there and t or you can't tell them unless you get up there and give them a tap or two to figure out what it is. So as far as the nailing pattern goes, it's going to vary uh, depending on the manufacturer. Uh, they are supposed to be installed on solid sheet, uh, fully under... Uh, full underlayment when it comes with it. Again, they're lightweight, so they're only one to 200 pounds and no more than one layer that goes up there. Uh, again, wide variety of shapes, sizes. Um, you know, we put a standing seam one up on here. Different types of seams. Everything should be kind of uniform as you're looking at it. If you start seeing screws sporadically screwed into holding places, you know, that's, I think it's self-explanatory. We got a problem here and we should document that and tell me to get somebody out there to figure out what's going on or ask for receipts. That's become one of my favorite things to do recently is what I call the, the journalist um, comments, you know. So when we start seeing something that looks like somebody did some sort of repairs and it looks a little hokey that comes on there, I... We, we actually started writing these into our comments, too. Um, we tell our clients to do the journalism. So ask them the who did it, you know, why was it done, what did they do, were there any warranties that, that were poor, you know, part of this repair, do you have any receipts and paperwork that comes with it? So basically the who, what, why, where, when, and how, you know, things were done. Put the ownage back on the seller of the house. You know, there's no reason why we have to take that ownage coming in there. If they hire somebody to get a repair, then that's the person who should be standing behind the work. We didn't do the repair. We shouldn't be standing behind it. So that's become my new favorite thing. Who, what, why, where, when, and how. Metal standing seams. Um, you know, this is more of a commercial one here where they'll get uh, thick metal. And some of these, they actually bend them right on site. They go ahead and make them. Other ones, they have to order them and have them delivered. Oops, sorry, I jumped a gun here. Um, I forgot, I think this is like a La Quinta hotel or something like that. I think those are the ones with the blue roofs, but I can't remember. I'm seeing that C sign off there on the left on there. So that's, what's making me think of it. But, um, I don't know when, uh, I'm getting flashbacks of an old movie, grumpy old men. And I remember when they were spraying the hoses on the, snow up there in Minnesota and and it would turn to ice and I guess the weight of it would come sliding down when they hit the door or something and they get clobbered with a big pile of snow on them. Um, I thought it was hilarious portion of the practical roof, especially when they missed their, you know, whatever. I just thought it was funny. Um, but that's what we're looking at here. These silver things, those are snow guards that are on there. Some of them look like they're broken or maybe it's just the angle of them. Um, but those are designed to keep the snow on the roof and not let everything slide off and hurt somebody. Roll roofing, um, not a big fan of roll roofing. So the next, next slides that we're going to be talking about, and I guess I should back up a little bit here. All of these are the typical roofing materials that we're going to run into on sloped roofs. All right. So again, sloped roof is anything over... 212, so 312 and above, 
312 is really considered a low slope roof. 412 is considered steep and conventional. Either word, they're interchangeable. And again, anything over 412 is also steep and conventional coming in there. Uh, sloped roofs are not designed to be watertight membranes. Um, they are designed to shed water and just let it drip off and go, on, go underneath. Even with these metal roofs, because they're going to be interlocking with each other, that is not a watertight seam when it comes to it. They actually have to, I don't know if they welded or solder or something, whatever they're going to do, they're going to seal that up in between there. Usually they're going to weld the metal and make it into one piece in order to make it a watertight membrane. The next ones we're going to talk about are going to be for flat roofs. These do have to be a watertight membrane. These are not designed to shed water. And I think I mentioned it earlier on, flat roofs are not supposed to be flat. They are supposed to be sloped. So they'll go ahead and shed some of that water. Roll roofing is probably the worst that we could ever run into. Um, me, I like to warn people when I start getting to uh, two years or three years of uh, lifespan left on a roof. And then, you know, so I could prepare my clients to go ahead and install it. But these things have an average lifespan of five to seven years. So even right as soon as they're installed, I'm going to be starting to prepare my clients that's going to have to be replaced and reinstalled. All right. Now, there are a couple of different methods that you can install roll roofing um, to go ahead and make it last longer. But most people, when they do it, they're only going to put one row with about a three inch overhang in there and it's just a single ply membrane that's holding everything up there. So as long as they install it that way, it is relatively lightweight. So you get one to 200 pounds on there. Um, no more than two layers, same as the asphalt shingles that come of it. Um, and then the nails, this, this is another thing that I just don't like. Uh, nails are actually exposed on rolled roofing and the and ARMA, the American Roofing Manufacturers Association, they're the ones that came up with this um, installation process. It's acceptable, you know, so they put them, like I said, every three inches and on the edges, you double it up and then you tar over it. And the biggest problem I have with the tar is that the UV rays of the sun hit it. And when that happens, it shortens the lifespan. And if it's exposed, again, we're only going to get about a year or two, and that's it. Now, in this drawing, they're showing um, it's installed in what they call a salvage installation. So only half of it is exposed. Now, these rolls are three feet wide, all right? So if we look at the layers in between there, and we're 18 inches, 18 is half of 36, uh, or somewhere in that ballpark, and then we can know we doubled up the layer. Once we start doing that, now we're going to get to the 10 to 15 year mark on the lifespan. Um, but that's never guaranteed either. And then you still want to go ahead and make sure everything's secured. Um, I don't know what to say. It's just, I'm just not a fan of it. I almost feel bad telling you that something's going to last that long. In my heart, I just don't ever believe that it does. And I'm sorry to any roofing manufacturer that might hear this but I just don't like this product at all. There's far better choices to go to, and we'll get to those in a little bit. All right. So common problems, um, if they're not, if the nails aren't covered, again, ARMA, American Roofing Manufacturers Association, they do need to be, the nails can be exposed, but they should be covered with tar. Um, fish mounts, which is gonna be at the seams, and what we're talking about is where they actually lift up and we can allow water to either get underneath it or be kicked and get damaged. It's called a fish mouth. Ridging is usually an indicator, and that's what these things up here are. It's all ridging. It's usually an indicator the water is in between the layers already. And in the summertime, when the sun hits it, it actually gets over 212 degrees. So it starts to boil that water and change it to steam and causes that to lift up. And that's how you get that ridging that's on there. Um, any worn areas, any ponding areas, these are all going to be problem areas as well that you know need to be addressed or at least need to be watched when we come to it.
Now there's two different ways that you can install rolled roofing. Um, the previous drawings they were talking about are showing parallel to the eave. I guess I should go back to that one here. So if this is the bottom of the roof down here, this is the eave, and then the slope is going up that way. So again, the eave and the slope is going up. That's We're installing this one parallel to eave. We can also install rolled roofing, and it's pretty common in the city of Chicago where they'll install it parallel to rake. Now this one here, the rake is off on the right hand side, and then basically they're just gonna go right at the top um, on these roofs and they'll roll it down, flip it over, and there's gonna be a, a pretty brave gentleman or lady that's gonna be tied off on a rope and they're gonna be swinging around on this thing while they're hammering all those nails into place. What we're not seeing is any sort of patching or tarring on top of it. Um, they did put tarring in between the layers and you know, I don't know, I still like to see it on top of this, but this is, in between the layers, is all that's really required when it comes in there. So I shouldn't be saying that it should be on top. I apologize for that. Items that affect the rate of roofing materials. Um, so the color. And I guess before that is UV exposure. We mentioned that earlier. Anything from the south and the west is going to have the strongest sunlight and the hottest sunlight. So that's going to damage the roof sooner. Um, color. Darker colors hold more heat. So because of which darker roofs are going to have a shorter lifespan. The hotter the roof is, it heats up the asphalt. When that happens, it releases the granules. And if the granules start going away, then the UV rays is able to deteriorate the asphalt. And then it's going to ruin the roof and we're going to have to replace it. Ventilation, this also goes to heat issues. We want to keep that attic. The main goal is to keep it the same temperature as it is outside when it gets superheated in that attic. Then again, we superheat the shingles and that's going to lose our granules and cause them to fall away, exposing our asphalt to the UV rays of the sun. Wind exposure, I'm not too sure how this really affects the, the, the shingles so much. But um, I think it more or less has to do with any sort of wind damage that would occur to the shingles themselves. Pitch, steeper the roof, the longer the lifespan. Uh, the complexi complexity of the roof, that has to do when we're talking about channeling water. So if I take a large area and I bring all that water to one location and then run it down through there, that's going to be... Um, a high flow area and that's going to want to wash away those granules and again when I get rid of the granules I expose the asphalt. Foot traffic, concentrated water, tree branches, those are all the same thing. Areas or items that are just going to start deteriorating the asphalt or the granules and expose the asphalt when it comes with it. I want you to look up your codes in your area. All right, in our area up north here we typically allow two layers, um, southern climates, one layer. Um, I'm not too sure how many northern climates still allow three, but we used to allow three, but not anymore. All right, now let's start getting into some flat roof systems. And we keep working from there. All right, so the first one, and we really don't do this too much anymore, but you are going to run into it. Um, and I should take that back. They still patch them. They still install them. You know, it is a cheaper way to go. And it's known as a built up roof. So what you're seeing up there, the BRRRR, that is an acronym. But I want you to know that acronym stands for built up roof. All right. So it's not a BRRRR roof. It's a built up roof. Typical lifespan is going to be 10 to 20 years. And that all depends on how many layers that they have of the built up roof. If they install it with three layers or every nine inches separating, then it's going to give us our 20 lifespan or 20 year lifespan. If they put it where there's only a half, you know, or 18 inches showing, then that's going to be our 10 year mark. And we'll talk about that with another diagram in a little bit. Um, so it does get hot mopped 
in place. Those are those stinky tar kettle things that started heating it up. They've sent buckets up there and they schmooey the stuff all over, put felt paper, schmooey more, more felt paper until they build it up the way they want it to be. Um, it does have to be installed on a solid roof. Um, it is the underlayment, so there really is no extra underlayment on there. We're never going to know how thick this roofing is. Um, I remember chatting with a few firemen, friends of mine from Chicago, where they deal with a lot of these built up roofs on their three flat buildings. And, you know, they said that they cut through two feet thick of tar in order to open up a roof to let the heat out so that the firemen can get inside to fight the fire. Um, you know, and it's like two feet and he goes, yep. You know, and they just keep digging and digging and digging until they get out of there. Um, I have actually seen, and I'll show a picture of a parapet wall. I've actually seen where the built up roof was built up so high. It was actually the roof material itself was higher than the parapet walls. They actually had to slope it down to get underneath the coping of the parapet walls in order to make that happen. So for us, it's going to be kind of difficult to be able to tell how high up it is or how thick it is, I should say. Um, weights, like I said, for a normal install is going to be three to 500 pounds. But the real thing is we're not going to know. Um, we're not going to know how many layers that there are up on there. So... Okay, and this is what I was talking about beforehand, depending on the layers. So what we're talking about here is this distance between this line and this line, and the distance between this line and this line, all right? So we know that the rolls come in 36 inch wide widths. Now, sometimes there's stone on top of this and you can't see those lines in there, um, but if you do, you know, deter or figuring out how wide apart they are tells us how many layers of felt they put in between there. And the more layers they put in there on this roof, the longer the lifespan is going to be. Um, so we're going to go with 10, 15, and 20. So if we got an 18 inch spread, that means there's two layers. That's going to be 10 year lifespan. If we have a 12 inch span between the lines, then that's going to be three layers of felt paper up on there, and that's going to be a 15-year lifespan. And then if we have nine inches, that's four year or four layers, and that's going to give us that 20-year lifespan that might come. Now, and then they're going to go ahead and put a flood coat over it, but usually that flood coat is relatively thin, and you can still see the the uh, lines going through it. In Chicago, our our process is to end up putting a UV reflective paint on top of that. Typically it's going to be white or silver in color. Um, you know, part of me thought that there was a, a thing for when planes came in, they saw that all the roofs were white, um, which was pretty decent, but nah, it's mostly for the UV rays. That's what it's for. Patch areas, worn areas, damaged areas, you know, look for ways where people are going to access through ladder ports, scuppers, ponding, tree branches, ridging, water flow areas. These are all just different places on the flat roofs we want to look for and document. Um, the biggest problem with built up roofs is if I'm leaking on the inside, we really don't know where that water is coming in from. Because there's so many different layers on there, that water can enter in one corner and drive all the way through everywhere else until it can then come in anywhere. And there's just no way to tell. So usually when we start getting leaks on the inside, they're going to talk about either putting a whole new mop coat up there or putting a whole new burr on top of it. Um, and again, it goes back to the original problem. Once we keep putting on new burrs and new built up roofs on it. We just keep getting a thicker, thicker, thicker. Eventually we're going to have to, you know, dig it all up and remove it and bring it back down to the substrate. But once we do that, then hopefully they're going to go with a single ply membrane 
and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So the term blister means water got in underneath the layers, um, heat got to it from the sun, caused it to steam and expand and caused that blister to happen. Usually we'll see it in ridging uh, as evidence of that, but sometimes we'll actually see where they pop and they're open and now we're exposed to the asphalt to the UV rays of the sun and that starts shortening the lifespans. So when you start seeing this ridging that we're showing in these drawings, now this tells us that we got water in that between the layers how much, where it's coming from, if it's still there, we're not going to know. All we know is it did happen at one time. You know, this is just a bad ponding of the roof. Um, I don't know. Even if there is no water there, you can still see all the debris and dirt and the lines that are going to be drawn on there. So we could still, even if it's like August and it hasn't rained in a while, we're still going to know that it's that it's ponding at that spot. And then you can see the different colors up there as well, especially when we're getting to the parapet walls up in here, or even down in this area, down low here. And that's all tar and patching. You know, once we get to that point, somebody needs to be up there every year. And you're gonna, again, just keep mopping it and putting more tar up there, or you're gonna finally get aggravated and Pull it all down and put a single ply membrane up there and get yourself a bunch of years. Next term I want you to be aware of is called alligatoring. And alligatoring is part of the product or process of the asphalt itself drying out. So when it dries out, it starts to shrink. And because there is no relief in it, so there's no place for it, no, like expansion joint or allow it to move. We're going to start getting a alligatoring skin pattern of the cracking. Now, just about everything that we run into, we're going to see that alligatoring. And it's not until it gets real bad, like this drawing here, is when we're really worried about stuff. I want to see if I could come back to that in a minute. I was looking for this one. Good. And I will come back to this here. So this still is alligatoring, all right? But at this point in time, it's just so minor that, I mean, I'm going to bring somebody's attention to it. Don't get me wrong. But I'm not worried about water entering at this point in time. If I go back to that other slide, you know, now we can see how thick those gaps are in between there. Now, I don't know exactly where it's going to be coming in from, but we're due you know, at this point in time. And I really don't even know if I want to keep building on something like this. You know, as far as my advice to the client, and that's what they're paying us for, is our opinions, I would start telling them, get all this removed and get rid of it and put a single ply. But maybe they can't afford it. So I definitely want to give them the options that they can go ahead and put another burr on top of it. But at that point in time, they should be getting a structural engineer out there just to make sure that the amount of weight, you know, because somebody's going to have to do a core sooner or later and see how thick that roof material is and try and determine what the weight of that roof material is and whether or not the structure can actually hold it and putting more on top of it. So, all right, two more words. Um, when we're dealing with flat roofs and especially burrs, we do have to have some sort of UV protection on there. Um, in the Chicagoland area, the most common thing is the white paint or silver paint that they put on there. That's our UV protection. The second most common is we're going to put gravel or stone up on there. That gravel is weight as well, but most importantly, it's to keep the UV rays from hitting the asphalt itself. All right? um, when the gravel gets pushed away, that's when we start having problems. So there's two different ways to get rid of it. It's either through water or through wind. All right. I do want you to know these two words. So wind scouring. Typically it's going to be by the edges. That's when the wind is blowing the gravel and exposing the burr or the built up roof. If it's being exposed via water, that's going to be erosion, also known as gravel erosion. And that's when water is going ahead and pushing the granules away. So wind scouring, when it gets blown away, gravel erosion, 
when the water takes it away. Fish mounts and ridging, we talked about this earlier when we were dealing with the rolled roofing materials and the same thing happens in built up roofs or EPDMs. I'm sorry, not EPDMs so much, but um, modified bitumen is what I was thinking of. So the fish mouth is when the seams start lifting up and that's what we're showing in this drawing here. Ponding is a test question I want you to be aware of. Um, HUD actually came up with this definition and that's the housing and urban development. And their definition is after it stopped raining, if there's still standing water after 48 hours, that definition is called ponding. And ponding actually shortens the lifespan of the roofing material by about 50%. So if something is supposed to last 20 years, chances are they're going to get 10. If that burr was installed with only two layers and we're only going to get 10 years out of it, if one of those areas is low and it's holding water, we're pretty much only going to get five years out of it. Cuts it by half. For the most part, ponding is pretty simple to see. you got a bunch of water standing there. However, there's going to be some times of the year where you're going to go out there and it hasn't rained in a month. And so all the water is going to, and it's hot, it's August. So everything's going to dry up and evaporate. And there's not going to be anything there. But what you are going to see are going to be these lines. Let's see if I could make this so these lines there we go that are going around the ponding and usually they're going to be a bunch of different rings and concentric rings that come in there because the ponding is going to keep the debris and and the dirt at different levels depending on how much water is there so you know, that's why we're going to have those concentric rings so if it hasn't rained in a while look for the stains um, if it, there's water there, then it's pretty much a no-brainer. So. Look for patching, especially up around the parapet walls. Uh, these areas are just, if the coping is starting to let water get in there, uh, we tend to get a lot of efflorescence and that salty deposits. It's very difficult for the tar to stick to, so that just releases and it starts pulling away. Look for different signs or different colors, I should say, of the tar that's up on there. You know, when you start seeing like light gray here and then a medium gray here and a darker gray there, that tells me that this has been patched numerous times. And it looks like it's going to be ongoing. If you haven't figured out yet, this orange stuff at the very top up here, that's the, that product great stuff, all right? that expandable styrofoam. And it turns orange like this after it's been exposed to the UV rays of the sun. You know, again, water's getting in there. People are fighting it to try and keep it from getting in there. Uh, this is going to be my client's problem to deal with once they own it. And again, I think they're paying us to go ahead and let them know about that stuff. So. EPDM, elastomer, polymer, DNA, monomer, whatever it is, you know, it's plastic or kind of a rubberish, I should say, roof that comes in there. Um, it's thin. Uh, the next roofing materials that we're going to be talking about are what we call single ply membranes. All right. Single ply membranes are not built up roofs. Built up roofs have two, three, four layers or four plies in them. These are all single ply membranes. They are either adhered onto the roof. Um, sometimes they're mechanically fastened to the roof. Sometimes they just lay there, you know, on the roof as well. So they're all a little bit different. EPDM is probably the most common that we're going to find up in this area. Typically, they're going to be gray, a dark black, or a dark gray, or almost black in color. But EPDM does come in many different colors, and it does come in white. So it's not a set in stone if it's EPDM is uh, referred to as PVC or plastic roofs. All right, this is more of a rubber. Um, lifespan is long. Typically, it's around 30 years. They are designed to go on flat roofs. They are going to be watertight membranes. So the seams do have to be sealed. 
Um, because there's single ply membrane, the overlap is typically, eh, I would say about two to three inches. It's not that big of an overhang. The rolls are anywhere from nine to 12 feet wide. When they get installed, they do have to be installed on solid sheathing. They are to be resting on the sheathing themselves. And they are not supposed to be stretched or floating or be able to hold anything like a trampoline. They just have to be rest on there. They're very lightweight and only one layer should be installed on this. So the seams do get sealed on these. Um, some of them have a like a chemical weld, like the PVC glue that we would use. Um, it's a different type of material that goes in there. Other welding methods are with heat. And then some of them actually have a, a tape seam that goes on top of it. And then they heat it up to go ahead and get everything secured. One thing when we're dealing with modified bitumen, I'm sorry, when we're dealing with single ply membrane roofing materials is we do not mix and match the roofing materials. All right. So when we're dealing with um, EPDM, only EPDM gets used. We can't put a PVC flashing or uh, modified bitumen or anything else that comes in there. So it's EPDM. We mix it with the flashings and then we're, our counter flashings are also going to be EPDM where it comes in. Um, that parapet wall that I showed you on the built up roof where it goes up. Anytime we go up with our flashing, I do want you to remember the magic number is eight inches. All right. I have to come up at least eight inches. That's for skylights. That's for plumbing stacks. That's for parapet walls. That's for uh, roof caps, anything that I have for any penetration, I have to come up at least eight inches. If it's less than that, we should document that as well. That's going to be done wrong. And it's probably going to be prone for water leakage to come in. Here's what an EPDM roof looks like. This actually has a tape seam where it comes to it. So we have an integral drain over here. Now what they did was they put the roof membrane down first and then they put the flashing for the drain on top of the original roof membrane. Then they put this square piece on top of the flashing for the drain and then they cut a hole for the drain in here. So that way if there's any water that comes through we got two layers of roofing with the flashing in between it and we're going to guide all our water coming into the drain itself. All right. Anytime we deal with a flat roof with integral drains, I have to have two, at least two, ways to drain the water off. So if I have full-blown parapet walls all the way around and the only way I'm draining water is through integral drains, I have to have at least two integral drains. If I have the roof sloped, like on our typical Chicago 3 flats, then we don't have to have a backup gutter on that. It'll, as long as it's open and it's able to overflow. If we go up here at the parapet wall, or actually this one just goes to another wall. Remember I said it needs to go up at least eight inches and then you'll see our termination strip from that point and on. And then same thing here as well. You'll end up seeing where our tape is in between the seams. That's a typical EPDM roof. This one was actually up in Underwriters Laboratories where these pictures were taken. And they were taken a while ago. And I honestly don't know what went on with this install. So as we said before, the EPDM roofs are supposed to be laying flat on the substrate. All right. But if you peek up right below the dot there, you can see where that EPDM is ripped and failed right there. And it looks like it just fell right in doesn't seem to be having any you know doesn't seem to be going down i should say along the parapet wall and resting loosely on there so we've been having an ongoing problem not to mention the repairs that they did the white stuff that we're seeing over here this is all pvc the dark black on there that's modified bitumen same thing over on this other side here that's modified bitumen and then when water, rain, snow, whatever came up on this roof, it started pulling everything out of there. Um, there were just so many things wrong on here. I honestly don't know how this roof would have lasted at all. All right. But I like this picture because it does show the different roofing materials 
for single ply membranes all on one photo and you can kind of compare them to it. And we're not supposed to do this. We're not supposed to be mixing and matching anything when it deals with single ply membranes. All right. Modified bitumen is our next one. I like to refer to these as torch down rubber roofs. Um, even though it says lifespan's 15 to 20 years, I think it's 20, 25 years, truthfully. Um, but there's nothing wrong with being conservative. They are designed for flat roofs. <coughs> they do put torches on these. Um, the glue and and the adhesive material and the self-sealing stuff is all built into it. I think it's a fantastic product. It looks a lot like uh, rolled roofing, um, but there's no nails that are installed with this. This is just adhered and glued onto the roof, plain and simple. Now, it does go on solid. Sheathing is fairly light, and again, only one layer should be installed. Sometimes you see the modified bitumen installed over built up roofs and they do that as the top sacrificial layer. Um, not designed to do that, but I hear people get pretty good success with it. So instead of keep building up, built up roof, built up roof, built up roof and keep going higher and higher and higher, they actually put one layer of modified bitumen and they get a longer lifespan out of it. All right. But um, if it's ponding in low levels and it's holding water, even there, there's no way that's going to last 20 years or more either. You know, that's going to shorten it by 50% as well. All right. Um, and the term bitumen or bitumen, I've heard it pronounced either way. And I think both are correct. So I really don't care how you say it. So it's modified bitumen or modified bitumen. Either way is fine. All right. Usually there's going to be an overlap at the seam. They're saying it's about three inches. We want to start at the bottom, work our way up. It should be parallel to Eve. I don't really see this. Well, pretty much this is only going to be installed on flat roofs. I don't really see it installed on slope roofs. The steeper the slope, they can usually get by with the rolled roofing. Then it'll last a lot longer. And they're not going to spend their time up there torching things down. Now with this drawing here, or with this picture here, um, you see where there's tar on top of the seams. And again, people don't put patching down um, just because they want to make it look pretty or whatever. They do it because there's a problem and they're chasing the problem. All right. So when we see this torch down and torch down properly, usually the spillage of the tar is typically going to be about a quarter of an inch, not too much more than that. All right. And that's kind of what we're talk about is this seam right in here now because it is a flat roof it is a single ply membrane and again even with burrs we want to go up eight inches i'm going to keep harping on that word and i hope you figure out that it's because you'll see it on a test someplace i'm sure all right again Modified bitumen, we come up eight inches into our parapet wall. Then we have our termination strip. I like to look at these seams and make sure they're nice and clean. Um, and this one I would try and get a little bit closer to to see if there's anything going on. Here's another good modified bitumen. You can see no nails. Um, even around the, the vent stacks up on top here, you'll see where they have... Um, Scroll cages or whatever that are sticking up underneath there. That flange that's there should be between the layers. But sometimes you're going to find where they'll put two of these. One is to keep the squirrels from getting up there. But this is so low, I think the squirrels will get on it anyway. Um, we took this picture because it was done wrong. There is not another layer underneath there. So that flange that's sticking out of that roof vent there, that is supposed to be between those the layer of the roofing and the counter flashing of the modified bitumen. Obviously, somebody made a mistake. Here they use it as a, a covering for a built-up roof. And there's just all the ridging, all the unevenness. It's You're not going to get the full life out of it. And for me, you're just better off tearing everything off and restarting it. You know, same thing, ridging. little bit of ponding, not a lot, but there is a little bit on there. All right. Problems that we end up finding are multiple layers. 
Um, no UV protection. So again, we should have some sort of paint or granules that when you see the gray covering like on the asphalt shingles, that is the UV protection, all right? So what we're talking about is a smooth black that needs to be painted or stones on there. Um, openings at the scenes, any sort of patching, ponding we talked about already, that's all good. The next one is going to be a PVC roof. Um, you see these in southern climates more than what you'll see here. Um, you'll also know them as TPOs or thermoplastic. Uh, you want to go to a good class. Firestone actually makes a lot of these roofing materials. And I think they're in Indiana, Indianapolis someplace. But you want to do a search and the, the training is free. In fact, I think they actually train you for free and they'll feed you for free. And the only thing you have to pay for is your hotel room and get yourself down there. Um, but the, the class is outstanding. You know, I, I can't encourage you enough if they're still doing it. But they break down how they make this roofing. They teach you more than what they'll teach the installers for these roofs. Um, and then how they're formulating their problem or their plastics, basically, so that they will survive better in our climates up here. The biggest problem with them, you know, they've been known as cool roofs as well. You'll see them installed in southern climates more than the northern climates here. Let me come back to this slide. Let's just look at this and talk about it first. Um, the biggest problem with them is when they get cold, they get brittle. And if something drops on it or somebody steps on it wrong way and it cracks, it's like um, like tempered glass breaking and it just shatters everything throughout. Um, and I've seen pictures of it and it's pretty scary. I haven't seen it from, with my own eyes, but mostly because we don't really install these things. Now the thermoplastics, TPO, TPOs, they are designing those to be installed in colder weather, all right? But I still want you to know this 55 degree mark on there. And when it's colder than that, I'm going to do everything I can to tell you not to walk on that roof. Don't take the chances. Obviously, you put the wrong foot and something goes wrong, then it's going to, there's just a good chance that it's going to crack and break. And why take it, all right? It is plastic, it is PVC. Same material that they make plumbing pipes and waistlines out of, all right? So treat it with respect, and that's about it. Typically, color is going to be white, but again, they make TPOs in all colors right now. So you will see the whites, the grays, the blacks. You may even see blues or something else with the two. I don't know, you know. So let's go through some of our notes and charts. Typical ice spans, about 30 years. It is designed to be on flat roofs, just like the EPDM. Exposure is nearly 100%. It is tape or heat welded or chemical melded when they put it together. We do need solid sheathing underneath it. There is no additional underlayment that's there. It is very lightweight, so it's only 100 to 200 pounds. And again, we should only have one layer, and this is a single ply membrane that comes in there. All right. How are we doing on time? I'm going to go through the flashings as well. And. There we go. Go through the flashing as well, and then we'll check on time again. All right, flashings, when are they needed? Anytime we have a change in material, anytime we have a change in direction of the roof, anytime we have a penetration through the roof, these are all areas that we require to have some sort of flashing. Um, the flashing does need to be watertight. These are going to be the most vulnerable areas um, to a roof and to water leakage that comes in there. And they are, they do have to be 
of a type of material that lasts as long as the main roof, if not longer. All right. And I don't know, for us, I, I can't push the flashing enough. So my process when I get up on a roof and walk in, um, the first thing I do is go up on the ladder. I stop right above there and I try to look at the shingles that are going into the overhang. And, and most of the roofs I run into are going to and walk on are going to be shingle roofs. It might be a roll roofing or a modified bitumen if it's flat or some other single ply membrane. But mostly for slope roof, it's going to be an asphalt shingle. So I'll stop there at the edge, look, make sure I got two layers, make sure that my, if it's flipped upside down, and most of the time it is, that that doesn't line up with any of my tabs or with um, the second layer of roofing. I've actually seen that. They started at the right and they put the first layer upside down, then they went back to the right again and put the other ones right on top of it. So every three feet, I had a clear line going through the bottom and sometimes you just got to, Shrug your shoulders and say, well, well, I don't know why they did this, but it is what it is. And usually you'll end up seeing water damage there as well. All right. Um, then I'm going to go ahead and walk the outside perimeter of the roof. Uh, that's where there's a lot of damage, whether it's ice damming or tree branches or somebody walking on it. That's where I usually find most of the damage occur. And then I'm going to beeline it to every flashing. So I'm going to go to the chimney, electric, roof vents, plumbing stacks, Anything where somebody drilled a hole in that roof and brought something up on there. And I'm going to try and look at it from every direction. Since they're weak and vulnerable, um, I want to be aggressive in those areas. And then I finish up looking at the field of the roof. All right. So the first flashing we're going to talk about is valleys. And there's basically two types of valley flashing. Anytime we deal with a hard roofing material, such as slate, shake, wood shingles, stone, concrete, you know, anything that's not bendable, um, we're forced to go with an open valley. Asphalt shingles, it's very common that we go with a closed valley. And so I want to talk about the asphalt shingles first. When we're talking about the closed valleys, there's two different types that I want you to be aware of. All right. And the first one is going to be the fully woven, um, the fully woven uh, valley, and that's what we're showing on the left-hand side. I cannot stress how poor these are. I mean, if you think about it, it's almost like tying your shoes, and you look at the both of them, and you're like, "Boy, that's got to be the best way to go." I, you know, just everything's overlapping and overlapping. And it just seems like it would shed the water that much better, but it doesn't. All right? Water tends to be caught in between the layers and then it starts running along the top of the shingles and then brings water into the side. They're just very prone to leakage. Um, not to mention they're just difficult to install. You're basically installing the two planes of the roof at the same time and you have to go horizontally all the way across and all the way across back again. It's just difficult for them to do. So a lot of times you'll see where they like to go straight up and straight up on an angle when they're installing these roofs. Um, the closed cut or half woven or what I hear mostly is the California cut. That's the more common method. And I think this has a higher success rate. So that's where the drawing that's on the right hand side. Now I'm still a firm believer that we put underlayment underneath, I'm sorry, I said under limit, but I meant to say ice and water shield underneath the valleys, whether it's fully woven or half woven, either way is fine. Um, but ice and water shield in the valleys is just a fantastic practice. It's not mandatory in all areas, but it's a great practice that comes in there. Now we're going to finish one plane first, and then we're going to put the other plane on top. It's not vitally important, but there is a method to every madness that's out there. So you want to figure out where the water is going to be coming down at the highest speed or the most amount of water with the greatest force. As we're looking at this, if, you know, we're hoping that the stuff on the left-hand side is going to be coming down faster than the stuff on the right-hand side so that that water would push it out of the valley. So the left-hand side is higher than the right-hand side. This line that we see down here, 
this is the actual center line. I'm talking about that short line. It looks like it only goes up two rows of shingles there. That's just to indicate the bottom or the center of the valley up in here. Now you can see where it's cut. It's actually cut about an inch or two inches higher than that center line. All right. And again, it's all designed to keep the water you know, flowing to the other side and not running back up underneath. I want you to know another term that you'll never see probably, and it's called cutting the points. So up on the top here on this top layer, I'm hoping you're able to see right underneath that dot where it's, it's cut on an angle. And the whole idea is that the water is running down here and it starts to get up underneath there. We want to push it back towards the middle and let it run down here. What we don't want to have it do is the water run down here, get trapped on top of this shingle, and then work its way underneath everything till it gets to the substrate and start leaking inside the house from there. All right. Um, I don't think that's that big of a problem. And the only reason why I'm saying that is I don't know any roofer who actually cuts those points like that, but that is the proper practice to do it. All right. And cutting the, the cut so it's up an inch or two above the center line, that's also another common practice. And that, that I do look for. Now, am I going to tell somebody to remove and redo? Hell no. You know, but um, I am going to be pretty aggressive looking for leaks in the valleys as well as any other flashing part. And same thing when I'm underneath. All right, I want to beeline it to these valleys, beeline it to all the flashing spots on the other side, on the underside, and look for water coming in there. So here you can see our typical closed cut, California cut, half woven valley. The left side runs all the way up and runs wild on there. The bigger roof is on the right side. So that's going to have the most amount of water. Looks like they're both the same pitch or slope. So we're going to put the bigger roof on top of the smaller roof with less water coming in there. We can use rolled roofing as an open valley material, so it is doable. Um, I do want you to know, and I have seen this, so it, it does get done. Um, and you probably will be tested on this because I do believe the National Home Inspectors Exam wants you to know about this as well. You, you need to know that how it's supposed to be installed. So we're gonna have two layers of rolled roofing. The first layer is going to be half the width. So again, it comes in about, not about, it comes in 36 inches. So they're going to cut that in half to be 18 inches. That's going to be face down. So if it does have any granules, that's going to be facing the roof and the smooth side comes up. All right. Then on top of that, we're going to have the sacrificial part. That's going to be full width, 36 inches, and that's going to be granules up. So we want to protect it with the UV rays and that's going to be, going all the way down on top of the other roofing material. So if I get at the bottom of the valley and I'm able to lift up on the shingles and I see this roll roofing there, I should be able to see the two layers um, at that point in time. I may not, but I should, you know, be able to see those in there. So two layers, bottom one, half the width and face down. Top one, full width, face up. Don't be surprised if you see that on a test question somewhere. All right. I'm a big fan of metal flashing. Um, if you're going to do any sort of opening, open valley flashing, then to me, that's just the only way to go. Um, there are a few options with that. Um, they can go ahead and just overlap it, as we're showing in the drawing here, because these things only come in about 10 foot lengths, all right? So we're not going to get one long piece that we're going to be able to bend and fit into that valley. So you know, the 10 foot runs, put them in a break, bend it, fit it in there, nail it down, um, move on. If I leave them where they just sit on top of each other and they don't connect to each other, then we need to have about a foot is what they're showing here of an overlap. We don't want to have less than an overlap. And I really don't even know if you'll be able to tell how much of an overlap that there is other than maybe looking at the total length of the total length of the metal itself if it's nine feet long then you know you got one foot of a covering of it so that's probably about the only way 
what happens with these slope roof, sloped roofs like this, when the wind's blowing, it, it actually moves at a higher speed to get up over the roof than it does down low. So it creates a negative pressure. And that negative, or I should say negative pressure inside the attic. So that negative pressure that's in the attic, um, that actually starts, you know, sucking water. So if we get water that's running down this valley, it'll actually be creating a little bit of a vacuum and there's a chance that water could be pulled up that 12 inches. That's the, the remarks and comments that were made to me on that stuff. So 12 inches is what that overlap should be. Um, better practice is when we intertwine them. So we bend one and bend the other one and we hook them in there together. Um, that you're going to actually see the, the folds and the bends on the overlap when that happens. That stops that negative pressure and that water from going up in there. All right. I want you to know the term upstand. All right. They're talking about this part right here or as we go up the valley going right down the middle. The purpose of that upstand is that when water is coming down this side, it hits that and stops it from shooting up and going on top of the shingles on the opposite side. All right, so that's called an upstand. And there's just a picture. So we can put open metal valley flashing on asphalt shingles. There is no problem with that. We'll see it on clay tiles. We'll see it everywhere else too. Um, not a common practice here. Just a little more expensive, a little more time consuming. Um, to do it and it's just, I don't know if the risk and the rewards are there. So it's not a very common practice that it happens. And we saw this picture a little bit earlier. Again, it's the metal flashing on the clay roofing materials. Hip and ridges. We saw some of this earlier when we were showing some of the damages. Um, so hips, ridges, they basically take that same um, asphalt three tab shingle and then they're going to cut them up into three different sections. Give them a slight bend, overlap them, and you're going to put it all the way up there as one tab going up the roof. Typically they'll trim it off on the inside so you get that nice clean look and you know the straighter the line the better. You know for me I always have to snap it. I'm never good at eyeballing that sort of stuff. So Chimney flashings a uh, few key terms on here. This is going to be a chimney that is less than 30 inches in width. All right. If we're less than 30 inches in width, um, then we're going to have the head flashing at the top, the step and counter flashing as we go down the sides, and the apron flashing at the bottom. So the head flashing is this part right up in here. Then underneath the shingles, and I think the next slide shows it better. Um, we're going to have one piece of baby tin or one piece of step flashing for every row that comes in there. And then on top of that, we're going to have our counter flashing. And at the very bottom is where our apron is going to be. So as we look at that step flashing, we want one baby tin. You know, first we put the shingles down, then the baby tin, then the shingles, then the baby tin, then the shingles. And we work our way all the way up the line. Um, what they're showing on this diagram is that you're supposed to groove out the mortar and embed the counter flashing into the mortar. Um, I don't really see that. It's not a common practice in our area. So I can't encourage you to look for that and, and call it out. You know, I have to give the um, standard work, I guess, you know, a little bit of credit. So sometimes they'll just put a straight piece going down there. And then they'll put sealant at the top of it to keep the water out. And it tends to work. You know, obviously any sealant, if it's not the type that's designed to, re, to be um, exposed to the UV rays, it could deteriorate. But nonetheless, it works. It's a common practice. So that's what I kind of look for. On chimneys that are 30 inches or wider, we have to divert the water to the left and to the right. All right. I do want you to know the term cricket also known as a saddle, also known as a diverter, all right? It's supposed to be installed on chimneys wider, or I should say 30 inches or wider. Typical bricks are going to be 8 inches. Um, so for me, you know, if I got 
what is it, four? Yeah, four bricks or more. I better have a saddle uh, going on there. So I try to just count the bricks. Three is 24, you know, then the fourth one is going to get me over that 30 inch mark coming in there. All right. Let's see if I get a better picture here for you. So this is looking down on one. Um, we still have the step flashing in between each one of those rows of shingles there. And again, this is what's pretty common that I see a lot. They'll take that aluminum, they'll put a bend on the bottom, they'll put a small bend at the top, they'll actually nail it into the mortar joints as they go up on each side, and then they put a bead of asphalt or some sort of UV sealant up there as well. Um, it works. I don't know what much more to say. Uh, we don't always see the embedding. On the high-end homes, we tend to see where they do a lot of step flashing. Um, or I should say Z-type flashing that's on there. Let's see if I got a picture of that. I think it'll show up a little bit later. Um, mushroom vents or roof vents. We talked about technically um, half the shingles are supposed to be underneath the metal and half are above. But this never bothers me. You know, I would rather see these nails covered or put up higher, I should say, and covered by the shingles. I'm not a big fan of having any sort of nail head showing when it comes to a roofing. But again, I'm going to look for it if they put sealant on it. And they do have, you know, it's like a clear sealant that's designed to be a, a roof sealant. So it doesn't get deteriorated with the UV rays of the sun. And it works. Uh, but I'm still going to look on the underside and see if there's any signs of water leakage coming in there. We saw this slide earlier. And we were talking about heated attics and hot stuff. Something I didn't mention earlier is all the dents that are on here as well. You know, don't be afraid to comment on stuff like that about hail damage. And I think I'm going to put Expert Roofing. I, I really like that organization a lot. And they do sponsor our state association. So that's another reason why I like them. But they're insurance adjusters. And whenever I see a roof that looks like it has some sort of hail damage on it, I kind of like to get them involved because a buyer, even though they have to get permission from the seller to do this, a buyer can make a claim on the seller's insurance that already exists because the insurer is going to be the company that insures the property when the damage occurs. So once you buy the property and then that insurance isn't covered anymore. All right. However, it, and you do have to get permission from the seller to do this. Um, you can make a claim if it's in less than a year. And if you find a roof that's in bad shape, <clears throat> and now we're looking at fourteen to twenty-five thousand dollars to replace a roof, if the insurance company will step in there, then both parties win. All right. And I'm not against that. I mean, for me, we pay for insurance for when these things happen and let them do their share. And I could get into a whole nother discussion of that, but I'm going to kind of skip it right now. Uh, patching. All right. And it's a little bit of us being a smart ass here where we put the flashing in a can. Again, patching isn't done for fun. You know, it's done because it was leaking and somebody's trying to stop it from leaking. And it is a temporary fix. It's not a permanent fix. All right. Plumbing stacks, same things. These are the rubber neoprene boots. Um, if you're, you've been doing some of the field training, I know when we use the Glenview houses, one of them has splits and breaks up on that where those neoprene boots are. So try and keep an eye out for those as well. Here they took the shingles all the way down the top of it. I'm okay with that. And the seal around it looks pretty good. Now, I have seen these neoprene boots installed on cast iron vent stacks. I'm a little worried sometimes that they're not going to be able to do their job. I'd rather see them only on PVC and see the lead boots on the cast iron. I just, because the cast iron just isn't as smooth as the PVC, I don't know if you're going to get such a tight fit in between there to keep the water out. Either way, we're looking on the other side. We're looking at the insulation on the floor. And we're going to be aggressive on these things. Now, this is the lead boot. They put it on a, a PVC one. 
that lead goes up over the top. I've actually seen people where they hit it with a hammer and they've actually cracked it and broke it up top there. I've seen where it's just been deteriorated the whole way. I actually got a picture where the whole sleeve has fell down and is actually the whole pipe is in the attic and never even went up there. So water can then easily come into that spot as well. Again, I like it when there's no nails that are showing. All right. So we had a picture with the modified bitumen earlier that showed a roof vent up there and it had the flanges out the bottom. I like this drawing down here pretty good because you can see where they put the original single ply membrane roof and then they put the, the stack jack up in there. And that's just a pipe with the flange on the bottom and then they put the same material on top of that as the counter flashing. And then at the very top, it's kind of a U-shaped that goes around the ring and that's what keeps the water from coming in there. Eight inches is our minimum for our height. We made that mention a few different times. And again, we don't mix and match materials. All right, same thing. This is more for PVC systems. I'm here to show on the whole height of the pipe being eight inches. That's not true. It's the cone that needs to be eight inches up. And these are for PVC pipes and more. Sometimes we'll see these concentric ones and then we're gonna have a ring going around there to keep it nice and tight. And here we have a lead um, boot over the top of it. And again, original roofing, put our boot down with the flat flange, fold it over the top, and then we put our counter flashing. That's the circle that we see up there. Pitch pans, you know, I get it. We don't normally see an I-beam going through the roof, but I think what they're trying to get across in this diagram is that you'll have different odd shaped materials. So like refrigerant lines, conduit, uh, low voltage lines, anything that's kind of, it's just not square and unique and easily flashable. So they're gonna put a box, send whatever that item is through the box, and then they're gonna fill it with coal tar, basically. So that's where they come up with the term pitch and pitch pans. Um, I'm not a big fan of these things. Again, you gotta, protect it from the UV rays. Um, nowadays, they, they go with these neoprene boots, and I just like this a lot better. So they'll have a pipe that comes out of there, run our tubes in there, then they could put the compression clamps on there and seal them up nice and tight. This box that was up there for the refrigerant lines, I thought this was fantastic. All right, so Kurt Mittenbuehler gave us this picture, and I was very thankful for that. This, these are the ones that I'm gonna have trouble with. So they get a pitch pan, fill them with tar, tar around the sides. I just can't see this lasting all that long. All right. I actually am gonna stop right here at the skylights just for a bit. I'm not leaving, I will be back, but I do have to take a short break, all right?
Okay, thank you for being patient with me. And let's keep moving on with the skylights. So the first thing about skylights, if they are like um, Velux or Pella makes uh, decent skylights as well. If they're UL listed skylights, so they're made by a manufacturer, then that skylight has to be installed to the manufacturer's specification. All right. None of these rules that I'm going to be pointing out regard those skylights. All right. So they all get installed to their manufacturers. What I'm talking about are these little plastic bubble skylights. Um, and you're going to see those on sloped roofs and flat roofs as well. All right. Now, there's an old joke about skylights. You know, they say there's three different types of skylights. Those that leak, those that condensate, and those that do both. All right. So anytime you have any skylight, whether it's manufactured by, <clears throat> by a quality company or if it's one of these bubble skylights that's shown in the picture, it, you want to be aggressive. So when you're looking at it from the top side, look for signs of any cracking, um, any fogging, especially up in this area right up in here. You can see from the top, look for signs of water stains or any center mold. I mean, in document anything that you can. Um, if you are able to, and you can get a ladder from the inside and get up in here, I get it. It's more work, it's more effort. Um, but if you can get up there and get a moisture meter in that area and see if anything is coming, coming in there or active at the time, I can't encourage you enough. And document those things. Even if you find that it's clean, document it, all right? Um, just because the the chances that it's are so likely that these are going to come back and leak in the future and people are going to say, why didn't you tell me? At least you could come back and say, well, it didn't present itself when I was there. And that always doesn't happen. All right. You can't predict the future and somebody can hide things from you where you can't see it. But if you did what you could to because you know that this is a, a problem area and you did everything you could, and it still showed clean, and you documented that everything was clean, I think you did your due diligence. So, just my two cents. Um, so, for sloped roofs, with these bubble lights, they can't be laid flat on the roof. They have to have a curb, all right? Flat roofs, remember we said before, eight inches. Sloped roofs, four inches. And I think that eight inch one is going to come up again here in just a little bit. So here they're showing where they put those bubble lights and they put it flat. You could pretty much guarantee that this one's going to leak. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to document what we see and just look hard as you can. That's about it. So eight inch minimum curb. Uh, can't strip. It's, uh, I'll wait a little bit till we get to the parapet walls. And we'll talk about that. That's mostly, oh no, it's going to be for single ply membranes as well. But you see a lot with the built up roofs when they end up doing that. Um, the whole idea is not to get a 90 degree turn. And like I said, we're going to wait. So here, same bubble skylight. Um, but even on older buildings, you're going to see, you know, sometimes these big atriums that are up there. And I think these things are beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I'm a nerd when it comes to old stuff. All right. But you can see when we get down into this area here, all the different patching and same thing right up in here, all the different sealants and patching that has been done around these skylights, they're just going to, it's going to happen. You know, they're going to kind of stay cold glass, warm, moist interior, humidity is going to kind of stay on the glass. It's going to drip down and damage the interior. Uh, sometimes people think that's a roof leak and not always is a, a roof leak. All right. But obviously if it's coming in when it's raining, then it most likely is. I'm a rocket scientist today, aren't I? All right. Sun tunnels. These are more of a do-it-yourself type thing. They get installed in the same premise as a, a roof vent would be installed. And then that tunnel is a, like a corrugated metal. And you could just stretch it and bring it to wherever you want. I hear pretty nice things about these things. You know, they're easy to install. And 
you know, during the daytime in an area, they just bring in constant light. So I, I don't know if anybody's had uh, any experience with these things, but I'm actually pretty impressed. So uh, skylights that you purchase, this drawing was taken off of Velux again. Um, bottom line is you follow their instructions. So usually they're going to be sitting on a couple brackets. They're going to have their step flashing built into them. They do have kits for it. I know with our metal roof, we had to have a special metal roof kit that was purchased for these things. Um, and we got two skylights up there and we have yet to have a problem. Now it's only been two years. All right. But we haven't had a problem up there at all. And we've had some pretty cold weather since that point in time. Um, ice damming does occur around these things because of the amount of heat that gets trapped up in there. So that melts the snow. And then once we get back to the insulated area, that's where we create our damming again. And if we hold water, you know, we don't, and on sloped roofs, normally we don't have uh, roofing material that is um, a watertight membrane unless they put ice and water shield underneath it. Um, so that is going to be an area for prone leakage. So, and there's no way for us to really tell that that happens. And th this one kind of threw me for a loop, you know, when, when you start seeing, first of all, skylights installed horizontally. All right. That means I got to cut away. What is that? About three rafters, maybe two. I got away with, you know, maybe a third. And then I, now I have to support that roof up above me. Um, and then this is again, one of those bubble skylights. I mean, the no brainer part out here is the glass is actually cracked, but the part that would bother me a lot is just that wide horizontal run. And there is no way to deflect that water that's coming down off that roof. So when it hits that, you know, there's, there's a lot of water on the top side of that, that skylight before it has to be pushed to the left and the right. And that can run up underneath it. And when you start seeing that, and then we look at our plumbing stacks over here, and I don't see any boots, and I see tar patching around all that, um, you got to start questioning the professionalism or the knowledge that somebody had when they were installing the skylight. So for me, it's um, I'd be nervous, and I guess that I leave it at that. But nonetheless, the good the good thing is it's broken. And we could tell them to get it fixed or replaced. And, it, you know, that's kind of an easy, easy one where we don't get people complaining about us too often. So we saw before on the chimney flashing, we talked about step flashing. And again, each row of shingles, we put a piece of step flashing. Then the next row of shingles, then another step flashing. So each one gets its own step flashing. One row, one step flashing. And, and they refer to them as baby tins. The counter flashing, however, can be the siding itself. So when we're dealing with vinyl, aluminum, sometimes wood, eaves, whatever, we could just run the siding as the counter flashing. In fact, that's better than trying to put the step flashing on the outside of it and then put a counter flashing in there. We're better off just running it up behind it. And that's it. Um, Test questions, where that blue arrow is, all right? We're supposed to have two inches between where the siding and the roof meet, all right? So I'm supposed to have a gap in there. Now, this is common. You'll see this a lot with vinyl and asphalt where they'll drop the J channel right on the roof and rest it on there. But we are supposed to have a two inch, you are supposed to see that step flashing that's underneath there, all right? Other things that are in this drawing is this plumbing stack right here on the wall. I'd be a little concerned about that. I don't know what I would tell someone to do about it, but nonetheless, I would definitely point it out what's going on there. But this part right in here is what I'm talking about. That's where we should have our two inch gap. I do want you to remember that two inch number, all right? This one here, this was one of our field training houses as well. And I think this is a second layer of roofing material, but I can't really prove it. And I didn't see, because we don't have that two inch gap, 
I couldn't verify that there's any uh, step flashing on there either. I didn't think that there was, and I think I got another picture that's going to show it in a second, because these shingles were actually butted up next to the wood siding on here. Instead of the siding being on top of the roof, the roof was butted up next to the siding. All right? So I didn't see any way. I mean, it might be down below with the first layer of shingles, but I didn't see any way that would keep the water from getting back there at all. I made a comment about the Z or the step flashing, and we see this on higher end homes as well. They'll take that copper and they'll make that stair step pattern that we're showing on here. They still end up putting sealant in there that is not embedded into the brickwork. It's just a, a design that we see up in this area. So here we're talking roof to wall flashing where it you know, it ends up coming down off the wall itself. Um, if they embed this into the brick, the the biggest problem with that is, again, the expansion and the contraction. That metal wants to grow and shrink a lot. And if I embed it into the brick, it just doesn't let it do that. And when it tries to grow and it's embedded into the brick, then you start getting the bottom end, you know, because it's, it's trying to grow, so it just basically pops up in a bunch of different spaces. So what they do to prevent that, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a bend on the bottom here, and that bend helps give it a, a crease, and that keeps it from popping. If I got two different angles here, then it's not going to want to bend or pop up. But in this case, it still happens, and you can see they put nails in there to try and keep it in place so it doesn't pop up anymore, but you know, that's not something we want to see, plain and simple. Just a close up of it, they're showing where everything's embedded. They put the nails in there. You can see the bend in the aluminum that I was talking about. And then those nails were covered with tar patching, you know, just to keep it from leaking because it's gonna be a, a pretty pretty likely chance that it's going to be leaking if the nails were exposed all right same situation but here we had more of a vinyl wood aluminum siding and we're supposed to tuck that flashing up underneath the siding in this situation this is the same house we saw earlier where they butted everything up to it we were able to get the shingles themselves up underneath the the wall cladding or the wood siding but there is no metal flashing that's between these two all they did was put sealant there you can see nails right at the top of the shingles so these were cut that's as far as it goes and then they nailed the top they even put a couple nails in the face on the bottom of it as well um yeah i don't know what to say and, and surprisingly this one wasn't leaking I mean, I was doing everything I could to find stuff on the inside. We had the thermal imager, the moisture meter. Um, we were, you know, I mean, it's all wall behind us. We weren't able to get into the attic space below it. But we were about as aggressive as we could be. And, you know, we didn't document it, but we still put, or let me take that back. We documented this was installed wrong, but we didn't document any water leakage was coming in. We still felt that was a high prone area. So... Drip edge flashing. Um, so the first section, this part here, is supposed to be the ice and water shield. When they're talking about the drip edge flashing, whether it's eave or rake flashing, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, I know there's different materials, different bends that people buy that go on the rake and not here, but for the most part, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, the one thing I want you to be aware of is the drip edge flashing here when it's at the eave. That's supposed to go underneath the ice and water shield. All right. So if you are going to, when you're walking up on your ladder and you lift up, you should see the, the drip edge flashing and then you should see the ice and water shield on top of that. If you get to the rake area and you peek around the corner, that drip edge flashing should go on top of the ice and water shield. 
and on top of the felt paper. Now, I find a lot of builders in our area when they put up all these different subdivisions, um, it's a common practice that they put their drip edge flashing and their rake edge flashing. They put that on top of the felt paper at both locations. Now, I don't know if they're supposed to move it or change it, you know, and somebody just doesn't do it. Um, but whatever. I want you to know that the drip edge flashing goes under the ice and water, water shield at the eave, and it goes over the ice and water shield at the rake. Please. Parapet walls. Um, parapet walls are walls. Usually they're going to be true brick buildings, but they don't always have to be. But these are going to be walls that go higher than the roof. All right. So the part that goes up is the parapet parapet wall. And then parts of the parapet wall. This is a brick one with a concrete cap on top of it. All right. Anytime we use organic material, such as concrete, clay tiles, um, even concrete bricks up there, that's called coping, C-O-P-I-N-G, is written on there. Um, the purpose of the coping is to keep water from entering the brick. Brick is porous, it actually has big holes in it. There's a gap in between the bricks because we have two widths. So we're showing on this one here, this column is known as a width. This column here is another width. So these are two widths thick, all right? So there's a gap in between the two of these. Best practice, not done often either, is we're after the top layer or sometimes right at the top layer, you're gonna see either a metal or some sort of rubber membrane that's going to be underneath the coping to prevent any water that gets through the coping from getting into the brick walls and working its way into the house. You know, the coping we're very aggressive with. We're gonna be looking for any cracks in any sealant, any cracks in the mortar joints and the coping itself, any damage whatsoever. And we're gonna document and tell people to get it fixed. Once that gets through there and gets into the brick and then it's got a clear path to come into the house, plain and simple. So we're really aggressive when it comes to the coping and the condition of it. Um, I used the term can't strip before, and that's what this is right here. In fact, when we saw the skylight, that actually had a can't strip around it as well. I'm going to actually go back to that because I think that's important to see. So bear with me a little as I scan back to a bunch of different drawings here. That's not the best picture. This one is. So what we're trying to do is we got a horizontal run in this roof here, and then we got the curb and we got straight going up here. So what we really want what we want to do is make a 45 degree angle here. Anytime I have a 90 degree angle, that's a spot that's just going to want to tear and rip. It's called three-sided adhesion. And so the whole idea is to give it a softer bend when it comes up on there, all right? So as I go back now to the side we were on, and we get back to our, so here's our roofing material that's on our roof. That roofing material is supposed to go up eight inches up above the flat roof there, but we don't want to have it to be a 90 degree angle. If it came into here and then just made this turn and went straight up, it would be easily damaged, all right? So what we end up doing is sometimes this is made out of styrofoam. Sometimes it's made out of wood. Um, I haven't seen a rubber one. I have seen foam ones that come in here. So, but we want to make this to be two 45 degree angles instead of one 90 degree angles. Um, typically this is going to be three inches by three inches and then they'll just cut the angle. So if they're going to use a, make it out of wood, they'll just take a four by four. So it'll be three and a half by three and a half. And then they'll 
slice it on an angle right down the middle and then they use both sides, all right? C-A-N-T, cant, and I want you to know what a cant strip is. It makes two 45 degree angles out of one 90 degree angle. And we want to see that on pretty much all flat roofs when they attach the parapet walls. Um, metal cap flashing does the same thing as the coping. I think this is a better product myself. Um, because there is so much expansion and contraction with this, however, we do have to put sealant in between the joints or the overlaps because, again, it only comes in 10-foot runs. And it, that sealant does break. It does have either adhesive failure or cohesive failure. It just breaks, plain and simple. Um, so, again, when you're looking at these things, you want to look at all those joints and make sure to see that this is in good shape and don't be afraid to document that you know um right on this area here where it comes over the front and it should be sloped so we direct the water to the inside where this part is here i usually reach over the edge and gently i give it a little bit of pressure all right you're going to find that these nails even though it's showing in the brick they're typically in the mortar but they will let loose they will rust out and then this part here is loose and when the wind hits it it actually blows this whole thing right up and over. And when it does that, obviously it could damage it. And then we let water get into the bricks and everything's for. So I just look to see to make sure everything is nice, tight, and secure and nothing is loose. So there's our coping. These are the joints that I'm talking about. If I start seeing a whole bunch of tar and patching up in there, I'm going to be a little aggressive. Our roofing material comes up eight inches. I'm going to document all sorts of patching and any water that sits up there as well. More coping, newer construction. Um, here we did have a, a membrane. I don't know if you could see it underneath there, you know, but there is a rubber membrane right underneath that coping. And they even put weep wicks in here, which I thought was fantastic. And that way, any water that does get in here, make sure our sealant is nice and tight. In between the joints, this was a brand new construction, and I was actually pretty happy with what I saw here. Um, when there are problems and people don't want to fix it properly, we're going to see where they'll take that roofing membrane and they'll drive it right up over the edge, and that's what we're looking at here. Um, that and you know, the different colors of patching that we have throughout here, I'm not confident that this one's going to do a good job. But again, I don't think anybody really would be confident that it would do a good job. So we're not going to get too much flack about calling this one out. All right. Here we could, when you start seeing these ridges that have gone on an angle like that, that pretty much tells me that the whole roofing material has shifted or pulled away from it. You can see that it's tighter along this parapet wall here as opposed to the back parapet wall here. We also have different patching up there. Um, again, I'm just not confident in this one at all. I may mention earlier about the different colors of patching and when water gets into the brick and efflorescence starts appearing, the efflorescence is this powdery stuff here. And no matter how much tar you put on that, you're not gonna get it to stick to it, all right? So this one was, th these are easy. Um, makes our job easy. We don't have to worry about being the bad guy on these. You know, it's open. Water's going to get in there. It's going to come to the interior. It's, if it's not doing it now, it's a matter of time. Because we see different colors of sealant and tarring on there, um, we know it has happened in the past. When we go on the inside, we should be using flashlights on an angle. Um, just to be looking for signs of past repairs. You want to be aggressive with the thermal imager, be aggressive with the moisture meter. If we could document that it's wet now, that makes life a lot easier for our clients. And that's all I got. All right. Um, I'm enjoying doing these. I Again, I hope they help and get you to think about a few different things. And next week we'll do another one and we're just going to keep doing them on Saturday mornings, and I like this two, three hour time frame. This seems to work pretty well, and they're nice, short, good chunks. So I think I'm gonna do exteriors next.
And other than that, thank you. And don't be afraid to send an email, text, any questions you have. And I appreciate everything. So, goodbye.